That's for the open the division. Division. Still on the I'd like to call this a regular meeting of the Board of Education, February 21st, 2018, um, to order. Please rise uh, for the uh, Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please uh, note that we have middle school artwork around here for your delectation, please. Uh, if you have a moment, take a look at it. Stunning. Different artwork. Just about every board meeting. Um, we have a memorial uh, resolution I'd like to read. Unanimously adopted by the Monroe Woodbury Board of Education at its regular meeting on Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. Whereas Mrs. Susan O'Sullivan was employed by the Monroe Woodbury Central School District as a typist. Her employment with the district began March 2003, and whereas, through her dedication to the district, Susan has touched the lives of many individuals, it is hereby resolved that the Board of Education on behalf of the entire district extends in memoriam its appreciation and gratitude, as well as its sincere condolence to the O'Sullivan family. It is hereby resolved and approved that the flag at the middle school will be flown at half staff on February 23rd, 2018, in memory of Susan O'Sullivan. As the above resolution is adopted by the board, it will become part of the official historical records of the district and will serve as a memorial lasting for all time. We are committed to academic achievement and success for all students in a safe environment. In partnership with families and our community, our mission is to promote confidence, inspire a passion for learning, and prepare our students to become responsible global citizens. Do I have a motion to approve the revised agenda? Motion, please. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, so carried, we will uh, have a short break um, after, let's see, uh, the um, policy manual, um, second reading, uh, so that the government students can scram. Can I say something before we start? I, I just wanted to take a moment. I just wanted to take a moment because um, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. <clears throat> to talk about what's happened this past week, first of all, our condolences go to the Parkland community. Tonight you're gonna hear from various people, including our student rep, and you're gonna hear from our safety officer who's gonna present a budget about you know, what we're doing as a school to keep our kids safe. But I need to take this moment to talk a little bit more about just safety. Because yes, we have to have better uh, gun legislation. Um, but we also have to provide mental health for our young people, for our community. And I really believe that we are in a crisis, not just in Orange County, but across the country. Um, we don't have enough resources for our young people. And I just wanna take a moment to say that I know that it's not easy for you guys.
and I hate the fact that I get emotional. So I apologize. Go. And boy, is it hot in here. But <laughs> see, laughter is easy. But, but you need to know that we care about you and that you matter. And that if we're going to make a change, we have to do it together. Because you really do matter. I mean, you just finished a survey, and 3,800 middle school and high school kids responded. There were 250 pages of comments that you all made. Well, guess what? We read them. And we hear you. And we're here to support you. And sometimes it may feel like we don't because adults have a way of doing that. But just know that we're here to support you and we care about you and that we know that this is hard. I didn't grow up in a time like this and this is not fair. And so we're gonna get through this together, but we're gonna be a better country if we start to work together as a team and hear you. So I apologize for the emotion. It's because I'm a mom and a grandmother but we hear you. So just thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or, and comments from interested citizens. Kim Laskorsky. <clears throat> thank you. Good evening. First, the week of September 5th was School Counselor Appreciation Week. I want to thank Wayne Williams and his department for all they do for our students and families. Second, with Mother Nature being so unpredictable, I want to thank Mrs. Rodriguez and Dawn Russell for making every decision with one goal, keeping our kids safe. Lastly, parents have asked me to speak about the topic of vaping, in particularly the newest trend, Jules, a pot of nicotine liquid that is compact, has no odor, has no smoke. I believe a pod, also known as a capsule bullet, holds 200 puffs. One pod is equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. Kids refer to this as Nick Sick. These puffs are shared amongst the students to get a five-minute buzz. Kids purchase these online, saying they are 18. They just check off a box and have it delivered to a home when mail is delivered before an adult is home. The usual cost is $15 a package that contains four pods. Some vaping devices look like pens, lipstick, flash drives, and charges by USB. I know the cabinet, the Board of Education, and administration are all well aware of the issues that exist within our schools, in the classrooms, in the bathroom, and on the buses. I applaud your efforts with the dog sweep, the topics being discussed in health classes, and your continued diligence to wanting to decrease drug use and vaping in our schools. Education is key, both for our students, families, and staff. With that said, there are our neighboring districts that have implemented a zero tolerance for vaping with strict consequences. I respectfully request that MW follow suit and looks into this course of action to keep our kids safe. I know you do not have rose-colored glasses on and you are aware of the odorless, smokeless vaping and the addition of marijuana and heroin to these jewels capsules. Mango most often is mixed with heroin and the kids who share are unaware what they are vaping. Losing one student to addiction or worse is one too many. There have been recent articles and studies that now support the dangers of vaping. A study from New York University warns that vaping can cause cancer. This contradicts the thought process that vaping was healthier for you than normal smoking. I am hoping for a policy that if you get caught vaping, you will be in violation of the substance abuse policy as set forth in the Code of Conduct. Consequences for bad choices and bad behavior need to be fairly and consistently enforced. In some schools, if you are caught vaping, you are drug tested. Some districts have an automatic three-day suspension for vaping. Some districts will suspend a first offender for five days, and they will not be permitted to participate in any athletics or school activities for seven days. Repeat offenders can be suspended up to 10 days and removed from all curricular activities for the year. We need to see which plan will be most effective for our students, but we cannot turn a blind eye because it is not illegal. Monroe Woodbury cannot tolerate the possession or use of vaping in our schools. I am asking our policy committee to please revisit the vaping and make the necessary changes to our drug policy to keep our kids safe from harm. There is also a need for parent education. 
together can we explore a forum to educate all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kim, um, you, thank you for sharing that with us. Remember I said how the students themselves gave us 250 pages of notes? That was one of your concerns as well. You shared with us that you're tired of going to the bathroom and having to deal with kids who are vaping, and you don't want to have to deal with that. So we've been working on a policy. Ironically, today we will be passing a policy because the policy committee met and discussed this. And so I will let um, Mr. DiLorenzo speak a little bit more when we get to policy, but there, there is going to be a policy enacted today on vaping um, because we hear you. And you, do you want to say anything now, or do you want to wait till we get to the policy? I'll, I'll talk after, because a lot okay. of what you said is what we already changed. So. <laughs> um, is there any uh, update on questions or comments from raised from interested citizens previously? There is. We had, um, I think Mrs. Lonick got up and spoke and said, were we considering adding, having other people participate or be a part of the budget process? And so we discussed it at Cabinet, and I think I, my feeling is, is that the budget process in itself lends itself to allow a lot of people to be a part of it. So for example, budgets at the high school um, begin with department chairs who give their recommendations based on what the teachers have said and what the, the building, the, the people within the building. So um, at this point, we're not looking to have another group that we're going to work with. We'd rather continue the way that we're doing it. And part of what we do is go out into the community and allow people to give us feedback um, on our proposed budget. Everything that's happening right now is simply a, is, is proposed. Um, I don't give my budget recommendation until April. And then the budget, the, the board votes on it. So I think that the process in itself, itself lends to have a lot of people um, give their opinion and their uh, support or not support. Patrick, did you want to say yeah, anything else? I, just, I think as a practical matter this year, it's a little late to have a budget advisory committee. Um, I've been part of those, and um, they're good. You engage the community. You educate people about the process, et cetera. They're very time consuming as well. Um, what I was thinking was um, we're going to review some of our survey results tomorrow at our core team meeting, and if, uh, if we see anything you know, within within those uh, survey results that are calling for that, we would certainly, you know, sort of uh, take that into consideration for, for next year's cycle. But uh, there's a lot of things going on, right? There's a lot of committees. Uh, we're, we're doing the uh, long-range plan, strategic plan, long-range facilities plan. Uh, we have a facilities committee. We have an audit committee. We have an informal uh, athletic field committee, so to speak. Um, so, um, you know, we have to use our time wisely, judiciously, and, and I think that would be the context that I would recommend we, we consider that. Um, should we also, should we have Frank um, talk before the students leave? Um, well, Frank, part of, of his, his part of his presentation, he will speak about yeah, safety. That's, that's, but that's the budget. So we should encourage the kids to stay the whole time. <laughs> Look at their faces. I'm like, oh. Are you get punished? And, and, and Frank is number four. <laughs> Frank is number four. Yeah, uh, so I think he should say something about. You're the you're the boss. You're the president. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. We'll motion. Right? I you am. Do. You yeah. are. Oh. You see that? what? That's a sign. <laughs> the great. You see? Maybe you're not the boss. I think we Maybe. should be getting something. <laughs> Maybe there's a higher authority. <laughs> yeah, there is. Maybe you're not the Somebody boss. Somebody disagrees. Not. <laughs> you're not the boss. That's the <laughs> that, that, that is. That is. That's the only thing. I would just like Frank to say something. So, Frank, say could something. you? Could you? I, 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 we're letting you guys uh, go or anybody else. Um, before the budget presentation, uh, but Frank Squillante has was going to be in the budget budget presentation, and it's about safety. So if you could if you could chat about that now, so that you folks hear it. Yeah, you just do it there. I think that that would be that that would. Be, am I putting you on the spot? You can do this now, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's going to do it now. It's okay, we just changed the whole agenda. Right. We just changed the agenda again. Do we need to vote on it? Forget it. 
Right. Motion. Motion. Second. 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 Yay. 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 Done. Done. He did no. I'm sorry. But. Is he presenting the budget or just talk about it? Or is he presenting the budget or just no. talk about it? Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. And we can. We can hear you. First of all, I, you know, in light of the tragedy of this week, a week ago today, um, I've been doing a lot of reflecting about, like everybody else has, about school safety, about what's going on in, in, in our country and in the world. Um, but I know and I can assure you that we have a, a lot of smart people here. We have a lot of smart people in the community. Um, we have a lot of smart people in our school district. We have a terrific relationship with our local law enforcement. I'd like to acknowledge Chief David Gotham, who's here from Monroe this evening, and right around the corner is Chief Kevin Watson from Woodbury. Uh, we have a great relationship with our, our state troopers. Those are the three municipalities that cover our school district. Um, so we communicate a lot. When we, when we look at every incident that happens, whether it's related to school or community, individual when we discuss it. Um, so, We've been doing a lot of reflecting. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the school safety staff that we have. You know, we have a, currently, we have about 15 full-time school safety officers district-wide. Uh, we also augment that with law enforcement, retired law enforcement professionals, uh, people from the police department, people from the correction department, retired military. They work as substitute safety officers. They bring many years of experience. Um, and they're part of our team. Uh, we look at every time something occurs, how we can be better at it. They, they work as school resource officers to some extent. Um, they're there to direct traffic. They're there to pay attention to who might be leaving a door open. They're not only at the high school and the middle school, we also have them at our elementary schools. And they, they, create, they create a safer environment and provide a valuable benefit to us. Um, Talking about our emergency preparedness and, and our technology in our district, I work very close with our assistant superintendent for technology to look at camera systems, panic alarm systems, the latest technologies that are out that might be a good tool for us to use. Um, we're looking at, a, we're actually rolling out a, a, an application called Anonymous Alerts. Anonymous Alerts, I don't know if you've heard, just so you know, it is a, a smart, phone reporting app that allows students after um, the ability to report information to school district administrators. Um, we share it at times with law enforcement. We may get counselors involved. It's another tool to make us be proactive. It's like see something, say something, which is a New York State initiative. Um, so we're confident that that's going to help us to get to the bottom of what's going on with some people and give them the help they need. Over the last few days alone, we've gotten information on several several uh, occasions which we followed up with law enforcement. And, and, and that's what we need. We need people to see something and say something. We're also gonna be looking at a visitor management system that's gonna provide um, people have to produce their government issued ID when they enter our schools. In the middle of March, we'll have one over at the high school and at the middle school. We're gonna use it from now to June. In the summer, we'll be rolling it out to the other five. <coughs> Our drills and emergency preparedness. I can't talk enough about the team of administrators, teachers, and staff members in our school. And I'm not just talking about only the administrators. I'm talking about the meters, greeters, the food service workers, the clerical, the monitors, everybody that's in the building when something could possibly occur. At the end of the day, we could get all the technology in the world, have all the tools at our disposal. But if the people in the building aren't empowered, and don't have any training and aren't able to, dare to react, we're gonna have a hard time reacting to that. So um, when we do our drills now, we use our secretaries to actually call the lockdown drills. We do lockdown drills during inconvenient times, when the cafeteria is in session, when the playgrounds are out. We do lockout drills. We do rapid bus recall drills. We do relocation drills. We try to be as creative with the drills as you, as you could imagine. Unfortunately, you have to think evil to protect against evil. And I speak to my colleagues in the, in, in the field. I go to other school districts. I con consult with law enforcement constantly. And they're at all our drills, I have to say. Every time we have a drill, 
the law enforcement are there. Woodbury and PD are there. They walk the buildings with us. They give us uh, professional advice and opinions to help us get better at what they do. The other thing they do is they get familiar with our buildings. They know our buildings a lot better than most law enforcement from other areas, trust me. Uh, we work closely with the county. We work with the New York State Department of Homeland Security. We have a group called CARE, Community Awareness Emergency Response Group. It's our group of federal, state, county, and local law enforcement, first responders, and elected officials. We meet at least twice a year, but we talk all the time. We get a lot of great input and advice from them. On 15 occasions alone this year, law enforcement used our facilities. They did drills at the high school. They did tactical room entries. They did tactics amongst themselves. They brought in canine dogs to do canine training. Um, we're planning a large scale drill in the upcoming months. I'm working closely with the two chiefs and the state troopers to put that together. Um, in January, I'm sorry, in December, we had an outside company come in and do an audit for us. They did a threat and vulnerability assessment. Essentially, it's an audit of our school district. They spent two days in December, they looked at our schools, they looked at our operations, and they have findings or recommendations to us. We're very, we're very open-minded. We're gonna be meeting with them on Monday with the district leadership to see what they have to say about some of the stuff that is going on in our district or what we have and what they can recommend. At the end of the day, it'll help us get better. Um, so I'm very optimistic that we have some good things in place and with the leadership of the school district, the support of the school board and our community, especially the community. I've gotten calls from retired FBI agents, active Secret Service agents, um, and people bend over backwards to come out and support everything we do. Together, we don't have all the answers, but we can improve it and make things better. So feel confident that we're going to be a lot safer and we're going to do the best we can to make things better. Be optimistic about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for jumping in at, no at this point. <clears throat> uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Board of Education January 24th? 2018 and the minutes of the special meeting working session January 31st, 2018. Motion. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Um, so carried. Reports by Board of Education um, committees. Chris, the policy committee. All right. So the policy committees, uh, we, we sat down and we looked at policy uh, 5640, which deals with smoking and other tobacco use on school premises. Uh, we reviewed them, we went to legal, we went to the state, we figured out what everyone was doing, and uh, we updated uh, this policy. This is a policy that is basically the school grounds. Okay, so we add, it's a long policy, but I'm going to go into what we changed. The use and or possession. Okay, guys, possession. So that means it's in your pocket, it's in your backpack, it's on your person. Of e-cigarettes, vaporizers, or any other products are prohibited. Paraphernalia such as e-cigarettes, vaporizers, and other products that may contain nicotine shall be seized by the district. The district reserves the right to give such paraphernalia to law enforcement as it deems necessary and appropriate. Students who use and or possess, I'm saying again, possess, you don't have to be using it, e-cigarettes, vaporizers, and other products that may contain nicotine shall be subject to disciplinary action in the facts may warrant in accordance with our district code of conduct. All right, first day of school, you guys all know the district code of conduct uh, pertaining to smoking and tobacco and drugs. Now, this type of product, any dispensary items are gonna be under this uh, policy. This policy also refers to students, guests, faculty. It's everyone that comes in the building. So you're not allowed to have it, you're not allowed to have it. You can't say, oh, I'm just visiting, oh, I'm a teacher here. Uh, you're not allowed to have it. Chris, I'm sorry, you said in the building, or on you grounds, mean school, grounds. school grounds? School grounds is parking lot anywhere that is on school grounds. Uh, it also is an extension of if you guys are on a school trip, uh, if you guys are on a away basketball game, or if you're anywhere that you are uh, representing our school, uh, it, the arm does carry into that uh, venue. Okay, the second policy is uh, 7320. <coughs> which is, pertains a little more to students, okay? This is, the first one was overall view. This is more of a student. So uh, some of the language is the same. 
uh, the use of cigarettes, vaporized, and all the products that may typically contain nicotine among young people for illegal drug, drug use has also become an increasing problem in the U.S. The use and all possession of these cigarettes, vaporizers, and all the products that may typically contain nicotine but can be utilized for illegal ju drug use, okay, so it doesn't just have to be used for nicotine, mm -hmm. use are strictly prohibited on school grounds and at school events. The paraphernalia such as e-cigarettes, vaporizers, and other products that may typically contain nicotine uh, utilize illegal drugs shall be seized by the district. The district <coughs> reserves the right to give such paraphernalia to law enforcement as well as the other one. Students who use and or possess e-cigarettes, vaporizers, and other products that may typically contain nicotine okay, of illegal use shall be subject to disciplinary actions and facts that may warrant accordance with the district's code of conduct. So some of this is repetitive. And the disciplinary measures we also updated uh, that consuming and sharing or selling or using or possessing such uh, products, alcohol, tobacco, uh, counterfeit and designer drugs or paraphernalia for use of such drugs shall be subject to disciplinary as the facts may warrant in accordance with the district code of conduct. All right, so we went through this. We looked. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. We tried to streamline it so everybody understands. Uh, we've, we're going to vote on this later. Uh, we're going to hope that the school principals, the middle school as well as the high school, not just, not just the high school problem, uh, I'm sure there's probably eighth grade parents out there and sixth grade parents, everyone's all concerned. Uh, that, however we do communications, we get this communicated to the parents. I know at high school you could have your morning. I know probably they're half asleep in the morning. They're not really listening <laughs> to the morning uh, announcements. But if we could do it for a couple of weeks, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, announcement so they get it in their heads for a week or so and revisit it later on, uh, if we can... E blast uh, the parents, uh, however you at the principal level see deemed fit to uh, get this message out there. But we want everyone to know that we changed the policy. It's not something that uh, should go unnoticed, and everyone should be aware of it. So there's not like, oh, I wasn't, I didn't know I couldn't be doing this in the bathroom routine. Uh, Thank you. There, there are going to uh, one other thing. We also are waiving the second reading for this. Uh, usually we have a first reading and a second reading. We're waiving the second reading tonight. Uh, a couple weeks back we decided it was, it was important and then we had a snow day canceling. So we're going to uh, waive the second reading. So this will go into effect today, tonight. Uh, my, my question is, it, can we be, uh, Stacy um, brought this up. Um, how, what are the, how specifically are we disseminating all of this information to the parents, the community, so, the students, the staff. So yeah. I had a conversation with Mr. Cassie. I'm trying to see if I can see him around here. Put your hands up. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to write a letter and we're going to communicate this to all the parents. It's going to be either through an email. We're going to post it on our website. Um, as you mentioned, we're going to go on our morning show and we'll talk to the students about this. But we're going to use every way of communicating to parents to let them know. But ultimately, it's the students. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the most important thing is that the students know that they can't do this. And you can't do this because it's not good for you. And you shouldn't be doing this. And you're not old enough to do it. And so we have to say it. And now there's policy. Um, and you've said it to me. So just again, so that you know, this is what the students in the high school wrote in their survey is that they're sick and tired of going to the bathroom and having kids vaping and them having to walk out of the bathroom smelling a certain way or having to deal with it. And you know what? You're 100% right. You shouldn't have to be exposed to that. So we're going to do everything as the adults here to make sure that if you're caught, and I think you've said it multiple times, don't bring it on school grounds. Don't carry it. Don't smoke it. Don't bring it here. Because you're not an old enough to be doing this, and it's not you, it's I illegal for you to do it. And we also talked about what if people have permission. It doesn't matter if you have permission by your parents. And also, it was any vehicle that was able to be used as, um, you know, a dispensary, any dispensary anything. item. And topical as well, and creams, correct? Well, whatever comes out. Anything, we kind of left it open so that when the new fed and its six comes months out, now comes mm -hmm. out, it's covered, covered under it. the policy. It's right. under we that don't have vehicle. to keep changing the policy. Right. Okay. Um, uh, 
Good. Don, did uh, there's any any update yes. on facility committee? Yeah, there's several things happened. We've been uh, chatting. Uh, John and I went to Albany to discuss. We have a uh, some legislation we're trying to get pushed through. Uh, we uh, had subsequent meetings with um, Assemblyman Scoopus. Uh, we met with um, Senator Larkin as well. I also met uh, this morning with uh, Assemblyman Scoopus, and he's pushing. He's trying to push forward the legislation. How successful it is, we're really not sure, um, but he's pushing it as hard as he can. On the DOT, um, I think the the position we're at. DOT has eminent domain, so most people have probably seen they've started working. So the the process with DOT is they take what they want, mm -hmm. and then you go back to court after they take what they want, and you argue if you don't feel like you were compensated fairly. So at this point, I would have to say that's probably the process that we're going to follow, most likely. Um, there's also some bid awards that... Uh, Patrick can can speak to yeah um, under the <clears throat> business and financial section we're awarding our um, transformer replacement project to uh, Ray Pantel electrical contractor uh, 990,000 is that award so that's within our budget just barely um, but um, that's big news that's going to occur this spring and uh, this summer so it's going to affect both uh, Central Valley it's going to be a lot going on this summer <laughs> Central Valley and, and pine tree, so um, so we'll have to uh, watch that closely to coordinate, you know, the DOT project and that transformer replacement project. All right. Any anything on uh, 131? We nothing that we need to report on. Well, uh, Elsie and I had a meeting with a representative of DOT, and um, they shared information. We, we requested some additional information. We're awaiting that okay. at this time, but they're they're taking. 1.89 acres from us. We've noticed they're, they're widening Route 32, so they're taking the trees down. We finally agreed on a letter of intent, which is, which is sort of like an agreement, like we're, you're going to do this and you're going to give us that kind of thing, um, and that enabled them to start this more quickly, which is beneficial for us. So okay. that's the update. All right. Thanks. Uh, okay, I just want to say, uh, yeah. it, with f facilities, uh, we met, uh, Patrick mentioned it before, uh, Laurie Hawk, athletic director and building and grounds, went through and looked at our field uh, fields and the way we use it. I mean, there's been complaints over the years, many complaints over how our students' fields are subsufficient or they're just bad at some point as the seasons go on. Uh, they've came up with a plan. Uh, we initiated through the community. Uh, we are closing fields 14 and 15, which are behind the middle school and fields 13 and 12, which is better known as the plateau, uh, for only school use. So for anybody out there in the community, it's only for our students' school use. It's not for your rec team or your lacrosse team or your soccer team. It's only going to be used for our kids to practice and play on. When it's there done, they're closed. Uh, and that hopefully will, will let the fields have rest time and they'll be able to water them. They'll be able to do some seeding or do whatever they need to do during the season to make sure that you guys have a field that's quali you know, a quality field to play on. No one's getting injured. Uh, and, and that was the other night we made that decision. So just want the community to know that those four main fields, along with the football field, which no one really uses for anything else but football, uh, will be closed to the public. So security will know if you're out there at 6.30 because you think nobody's on there and you're practicing your soccer team, <laughs> security notices you, you might have a problem. Your whole entire organization might not be able to use anything on our property again. Uh, I know it sounds drastic, but, uh, you know, our fields have been used and abused for a long time, and there's really no way for us to combat it. And with the DOT project taking grass from us, when we get to it. Uh, it's not. It's not going to be uh, advantageous for our students. So, just wanted you guys to know that's what we decided, or they decided, and the board stands behind the uh, building and grounds and the athletic office. And uh, just to, a, a reminder, this is to try and keep these, shall we say, subpar athletic facilities of ours running as well as as possible before a um, capital project which we hope will incredibly upgrade all of our athletic facilities. But that won't happen for a few years the rate the state goes. So uh, we'll try our best to make things safe. 
Um, uh, Don and I went up. I just want to mention uh, one thing. Uh, when we were up in Albany, um, meeting with Senator Larkin and Congressman Skoufis, uh, Mary Ellen Elia, who is the uh, commissioner of the State Education Department for two and a half years now, um, spoke. Um, and here are some of the things that she said, which I um, briefly. Um, she wants to increase opportunities for advanced coursework. I know that we're um, all for that. Uh, the State Education Department is going to back something like that. Graduation rates um, at school districts will now include five and six year rates as well as four year rates. Um, she's very much supporting a balanced curriculum. We certainly have that in Monroe Woodbury. It's nice to know that the State Education Department um, backs things like art and drama and music. And all. Um, the new standards that will be put in it seems to be new standards every year. Anyway, new standards will be studied for three years before implementation in classrooms. Um, and for the assessments, there are now two-day ELA and two-day math uh, written assessments. All questions are now written by New York State teachers. And I didn't realize this. There is no time limit to test for anybody, let alone special ed students. Right. Okay. Um, there is a moratorium through school year 2018-19 to use assessments for APPR. Um, and she says any data from these assessments should be used to support teachers. A positive and feedback oriented and collaborative use of such assess assessments. Um, teachers are a most important component and need to be supported and improving every day. She is trying to get a waiver for special ed students to test at their appropriate grade level. Uh, the districts have to submit plans about what to do with the opt-out students in these testings. And I will get more information on opt-outs and what the implications are for the, for the district, district from the um, New York State School Boards Association. Um, there are pros and, and, and cons. We need testing input. But it's been abused. I'm not talking about abuse by the opt-out people. But you know, when you have tests that are, I don't know. Let's use a highfalutin term, wacky. Then we don't. Uh, you know, how can we, uh, how can we rely on? Um, and uh, Commissioner Elliott found that the best ideas she has gotten in her two and a half year tenure come from guess who? Teachers in the classroom, because they know what's going on. Um, report by student representative Sanjana Shasha Kumar. We've been all over this agenda. What? Hmm? We've been all over this agenda. have some pictures of my friends. Okay, sorry. Um, so some updates over the past few weeks as I have unfortunately not seen very many of you for a long time. I apologize for that, but we're gonna go back a few months. Um, in December, I along with many members of our district participated in Pine Trees Readathon. Um, the thank you to Mr. Judius and Mr. Martin for all of their efforts that they put into that. I think um, um, at the end of December, I also got a chance to read at Sapphire. Um, and a few weeks after that, I brought some friends with me to Sapphire to the Sapphire movie night, um, where high school students sat next to some kindergartners and some first graders, ate some popcorn, watched Cars 3. Um, and that connection really did start to develop between these students. Um, and events like this where we get to connect across schools is very, very beneficial, not only to the students who are getting read to, but to the ones who are able to take away the smiling face of a kindergartner and being excited to talk to somebody in their community. Um, that value is there besides all the benefits of encouraging reading and encouraging 
just being a part of this community outside the classroom. So that's kind of what's been happening down there. Um, across the district, um, students were participating in their passion for the arts. Um, this past month, the high school and middle school students performed in our slightly unconventional um, prism concerts and kaleidoscope concerts, um, which were all very successful at Central Valley. There was the excellent performance of Lion King Jr. Um, and they get, did a wonderful job and excellent turnout. But again, it's just their ability to express themselves in the arts outside the classroom um, was something that they found a lot of joy. And I was very happy to support that. I'm very happy that the board in the district is in support of that as well. Um, next month, um, uh, at North Main, they're going to put on a wonderful performance of Seussical Jr. Um, I got a chance to meet with some of the students at North Main yesterday. Um, the performance is on March 3rd at 7 p.m. and March 4th at 2 p.m. And as the cat in the hat, his name is Sol, um, expressed to me, he loves the feeling of walking on stage and seeing everyone smile at him before he starts to perform. Um, I hope to see as many of you smiling at him, Summer, Brandon, Alicia, Brady, and over 100 students who have been participating in this performance next month. Um, the other thing that, see, this is some of that leading cast who I got to talk to yesterday. Um, but outside of their passion for the performing arts, we talked about um, community within North Maine and, as I mentioned before, the community that exists in Monroe Avery outside the classroom. Um, these students are very, very grateful for being able to participate in a musical where they're not in the classroom and they're able to connect with students who are in different classes and in different grades. Um, and they are able to make those kinds of friendships and be a part of a community where they know that they're accepted and for what they love. Um, and they expressed to me with many concerns about how they know of many other students within their classrooms who don't feel that same kind of niche. Um, and having spoken with Mr. Davis and Mr. Cotto about this, um, there are a lot of difficulties around creating these many different niches within these elementary schools within North Main, Pine Tree, Central Valley, but I spoke with Mr. Masano how these, it's easier for these to exist at the middle school because you have the access to more clubs, more activities, transportation becomes less of an issue with the after school buses. And we're, we've begun to bounce around this idea of bringing forward students, representatives of these clubs from the middle school into Central Valley, into Pine Tree, into North Main, so those last weeks of fifth grade, and communicating with them the value of being part of this community, this club outside of the classroom. Um, many students having gone through, especially seniors now that I have talked to, talk about how they wish they had gotten involved earlier. How besides there are so many opportunities that the high school and middle school can give to them that they just aren't aware of. And besides the fact that these opportunities can help students get into college, help them become well-rounded citizens, provides them that sense of community, that sense of belonging that they may not feel inside the classroom just because of what the situation is. So um, we've been thinking about pulling students who went through Central Valley and that student that went to Central Valley is now the president of the student council of the middle school. And they go back to Central Valley and talk to the fifth graders saying, you guys should participate and lead. And then someone who won a medal in the Science Olympiad competition, an eighth grader comes back and said, I went to Pine Tree, I joined the science club, I met my best friend in the science club. And outside of your classes, outside of where you learn, there's still a place for you to be a member of this community in Monroe where you are with, are you, where you're doing something that you love and you are not, you're accepted for doing what you love. Um, so, and I was very happy that these students were able to see the value of that and understand that that's a big part, a big part of being a student isn't just sitting in class, doing your homework, um, raising your hand to answer a question, it's being, participating in this community. Um, okay. The last thing that I would like to talk about is something that I understand is a very complicated issue, um, but it has touched the hearts of so many minority students and I don't think I would be doing my job if I didn't address it tonight. I would first like to offer my very strong condolences 
to the community of Parkland, Florida. And more importantly, I would like to offer the students, the student community, um, condolences. But beyond that, the students would like to offer their voices in solidarity with the students across the nation as we tackle the lack of response and increased need for school safety and gun reform. Students in Florida, along with students in Monroe, have recognized that thoughts and prayers are not enough. It's not enough anymore. And because of this, have begun to organize assemblies um, to express their concerns. And one of these venues, one of these venues, I apologize, um, is a national student walkout on March 14th at 10 a.m. for 17 minutes. To the students of Florida and to the students of the Monroe Woodbury community, this walkout is an opportunity to express their voice and stand in solidarity with other students who think the same way. This district is devoted to the development and, and the development of responsible global citizens. This means to students that they are contributing members to a community larger than themselves. And now an opportunity has presented itself where students can learn what it means to be active in a national community and apply those skills in an environment where they do feel safe in an attempt to make other students across the country feel safe in their own buildings as well. Because the recognized reality is that there are students who don't feel safe in their buildings. This, this walkout does mean something to students. And it would give them the means to express their concerns over this incredibly pressing issue. And more than anything, we want to involve the board, central administration, building administration in the conversation. Because as a district, the most successful we can be in how we express our voices is through communication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjana. Um, we get to tell you guys what to do, like vaping. Right? That's Elsie said, we're telling you what to do. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Here's where you can tell us what to do. You have a voice, and it's an important voice, and we need to listen, and you need to speak loudly with your voice. So that's that. Thank you. Us old white guys have screwed up enough. <laughs> Could you, you know your place now? Because we're like oh, I know. two back Something's going to fall off right. the wall again on me. I think we're out of German. I thought. Oh, we're out of German? No, you got to vote. Like, you got to vote on our policy. Right. We're going to. <laughs> All right. Um, we have the uh, first reading of uh, the policy that uh, Chris mentioned policy uh, 5640 and 7320. Do I have a motion to approve the first reading of those policies? Motion. motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions, comments? Can I make one, com one more comment? Yes. Um, Mr. Cassie is going to be emailing all the students in the high school the letter that their parents are getting. So everyone is going to get this email using their Gmail, right? For the, okay. For the vaping policy, yes. Thank you. Can I just add one other thing to that? Just because I do still see that we have a lot of the government students. I happen to bring it up to my two kids tonight. And I have to say that probably one of the best ways for a lot of the kids to get it out is to put it on their Snapchat story. So put it out there <laughs> that there is a new policy on vaping. And you can go to the Monroe Woodbury website tomorrow, hopefully, and it'll be posted. So there you go. I bet you everybody will find out about it before uh, 10, 10 o'clock. <laughs> so there you go. Snapchat will get the word out. Mr. Castile will have less to do. Uh, I like that. They probably know that. All those, that. Else, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. Uh, do I have a motion to waive the second reading motion of the, second. those two policies? <laughs> Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried, those policies are now in effect. Um, do I have a motion to approve the second reading of the policy manual updates from last time? 
8140. Anyway, programs for students with disabilities, allocation of space for special education programs, school-wide pre-referral approaches and interventions, confidentiality and access to IEPs and IESPs, and available, availability of alternative format instructional materials for students with disabilities, district-wide state uh, assessment, uh, district -wide, yeah, statewide assessments of students with disabilities, impartial hearing officer appointments and compensation. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> um, so carried. Let's have a short break before we do the budget. We are uh, calling the regular meeting back into session. Have a seat. Before we start, John. Oh, no. Who's going ask first? Do you have any questions about Don't. the last resolution? Huh? We passed it. What resolution? On the policies. About the the second it. reading? The second reading. I just want to ask a question about this policy on the special ed on the, oh, the allocation of space. Okay. So it says the Board of Education recognizes that a school need not make uh, need not make every effort on every part of its existing facilities accessible if it can relocate or reschedule enough classes so as to offer required courses and um, electives in um, accessible areas. I have a question that has to do with uh, Walk Week. So is that being is this something that is being addressed that when you have Block Week and there are students that don't take the test that are special ed students that are non-credentialed in a 12-1-1 class, will they have a day of school because they're entitled to a day of school? So that's an excellent question because we had just, we have been talking about this with the high school about midterms and how we provide midterms and the fact that our special ed students don't get school for about, what is it, two weeks, give or take. So four days, of testing. four days of testing. So we are, this policy doesn't address that, but the um, midterm question is being addressed. Okay. And I think that when they're done, I'm looking at John and looking at, at Heath, that it would be good for the board to hear a presentation because you're in the middle of working with department chairs. It is, that is one of our greatest concerns that there is a loss of instructional time when we are uh, administering these, these tests. And how can we do it more effectively so that students don't lose instructional time? In particular, our special ed students. So I thank you for asking Yeah, that. good, thanks, sorry. Thank you. Uh, now we'll review a book one of the Whoa. budget. Patrick Cahill and gang. Thank you, John, and uh, I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, our 2018-19 preliminary budget. Welcome. One, and uh, when I talk about the budget, we're talking about the general fund of the budget. The district has several funds. Uh, the general fund is the principal operating fund of, of the district. It is, as far as I know, the probably the only municipal budget that's voted on by the uh, the populace directly, um, much to our chagrin uh, occasionally, right? Um, but in any case, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, budget development process vis-a-vis -vis state aid. We're going to uh, review briefly our uh, state aid runs, our projections for next year. We're going to talk about the tax cap. I, I put refresher up there. What I'd like to do is defer the specific conversation about our tax cap until our next meeting in two weeks. Uh, there's a few elements to the cap that we're still reviewing. But what I wanted to do is just sort of go through the process a little bit with everyone tonight. Uh, and that's why I'm calling it a refresher. We'll have more specific data next, the next meeting. Uh, we're also going to hear from Don Russell, who's going to discuss the transportation budget. Peter Quarteroni is going to uh, review the operations and maintenance budget. Frank Squalante will review uh, safety and security budget, and Bargov VS will discuss the data processing, computer-assisted instruction, central printing, and library media budgets this evening. 
Okay, so I, uh, I've thrown this slide up there in the past. It's uh, essentially a review of budget terminology. I won't go through every definition, um, thankfully. Uh, I just put it up there uh, as, a, as a means of having a common language amongst us for the discussion. One of the, uh, I'll just point out one item here. So fund balance, when we talk about fund balance in the context of budget, it's usually unassigned fund balance, which is the sort of the free and clear fund balance uh, to the auditor. That fund balance has a much more specific meaning. Um, but um, fund balance would be, in the old days, we called it the unappropriated, mean it, meaning it was not appropriated for the next year's budget, unreserved, meaning it's not part of a reserve, uh, fund balance. And we're limited to 4% fund balance by law, and it's 4% of our subsequent year budget. So we are in good shape. We have 4%, and I don't see that changing uh, based on the, re the financial results, results excuse me, of our 17-18 um, year. The, the other uh, term I want to point out, I, I I said I wouldn't do this, but I'll just point out one other one. The maximum allowable tax levy, that is sort of the bottom line in the tax cap computation. And if you recall, the tax cap, the 2% cap, it's, it's really an eight-step process. And 2% or CPI, whichever is less, is one of the factors in that, uh, in that computation. So the maximum allowable levy is really the bottom line. That's really like what is the limit that we can go up to. Um, and sometimes that's, people use that term or the term tax cap and, and really that's what we're talking about. That's the limit. So I will move on. Okay, so what I generally like to do is provide sort of a very high overview of some of the issues and the challenges in the, uh, for the upcoming budget year. Uh, I have up here, as I have in the past few years, the property tax cap levy growth factor is at 2%. Now, that's actually good news. Uh, for this year, last year, for this year, that uh, growth factor was 1.26%. And if you recall, two years ago, it was 0.12%. So we're trending in the right direction. The formula is 2% or CPI, whichever is less. So CPI this year was 2.13%. I had mentioned in the past as inflation starts to increase, the economy starts to heat up a little bit, we can have issues with the 2% cap. If inflation's at 3% and we're limited to 2 obviously that would be a problem in the long run. But uh, needless to say, it's starting to move in the other direction where the 2% cap is literally 2% this year. The other uh, thing I'd like to point out for Monroe Woodbury specifically, our tax base growth factor is, again, above average. It's 1.7 percent, and I'm showing that right here. If you recall, last year our tax base growth factor was was 3.1 percent, quite high, and that in the formula is sort of the first factor that adjusts the prior year levy, and it accounts for you know sort of development, brick and mortar changes in the community, and so that's good. That's good news for us. It, it means right off the bat, our maximum allowable levy would be. 1.7% higher than, than it would ordinarily be. The county average was 1.22% for next year, and the range was a zero to 6.7% uh, as far as the tax base growth factor. <coughs> the foundation aid formula continues to uh, defer the full phase in of that. We've discussed this in the past. I won't belabor it, uh, but we'll, we'll just say for foundation aid for next year, Bless you. Uh, we are looking at approximately a $737,000 uh, budget to budget increase. We're slated, and, and this is based on the governor's executive proposal, so it generally increases a little bit by the, by the time they, they, the legislature and the governor come together on an agreement. But the proposal for, for next year for foundation aid is $30.1 million for us. Uh, I've talked about this in the past. Our average annual loss in foundation aid due to the, the deferred full phase in is about eight and a half million dollars. So it would be very beneficial for our district if the uh, 
the state leaders got together and, and just rolled this formula out the way it was intended. You know, the original intent of foundation aid was to be more equitable, uh, uh, more equity, more adequacy, you know, in state aid. And uh, the state had its own financial problems in 2007 and 8, and they, and they just couldn't fully phase it in. And that's continued uh, for political reasons. So, um, you know, the last sub-bullet here is full phase-in would benefit us substantially. And believe it or not, there are districts that full phase-in would result in a loss or a decrease in foundation aid because they were frozen and for political reasons, uh, it's tough to ever take away state aid from a school district. Um, I'm going to get into it a little bit more, but the regents last year proposed a three-year phase-in, which would have been great. They've backed off on that. They're still proposing a phase-in, but it's more open-ended. I have Curious Joel annexation and, and request for transportation. Now this uh, may not come to pass f for next year, but ultimately a loss in property tax revenue would, would result around $900,000 um, with the annexation, the ultimate annexation and uh, creation of the new town. There are some cost reductions, but this was the, uh, with all the projections that we made, this was the one variable that was known. So I have that up there as a challenge. The other thing, which uh, Dawn Russell will discuss a little bit more, is the increasing request for transportation uh, for residents attending non-public schools within the 15 mile legal limit. So we as a public school are obligated to provide transportation to residents who attend non-public schools if, if it's within these mileage limits. And it's a cost to the district, and we accept that, it's the law. But we've been seeing some significant increases. And so for next year's budget, the increase is from 700,000 to 805,000, the budget, the budget request. So uh, Dawn will talk more about that, but that's been a number that's been really increasing the last few years and we have to watch that. We have continued increases in health insurance premiums uh, at 7%. The trustees of the health plan voted about a month ago to increase the premiums 7% for next year. That's about 1.3 to 1.5 million dollars to our budget, which is big money <laughs> to me. It's significant. It's it's seven percent is better than 18, which was the increase we took for this year, but it's still a, a fairly uh, sizable uh, increase on the budget, and it's and it's tough to deal with. Um, the one thing, the the good news, the silver lining here is. The health plan is in better financial condition. The benefit changes that we made last year and the premium increase are working. So we we feel with a 7% premium increase next year, we'll cover our expenses and start to re replenish the reserves that were drawn down in the 2016-17 uh, year. I have contractual salary increases, step plus a per the percentage increase on there. The last couple of years, that was those contracts were we're open, so it's good news. We've settled our contracts. We we now know uh, to a large degree what the salary increases will be for for most of our employees. But it's it still puts pressure on the budget, and and that's why I had that up there. And um, and there's a for many employees there's a step plus a percentage increase. So it's it's more than just the percentage increase, and there. There's something called breakage where we have teachers or staff that retire at a high salary and we hire someone at a, a lower salary. Uh, rarely is that breakage ever uh, equal or even come close to the, just the contractual annual increase. So just items that put pressure on our budget. Need for capital projects has not gone away, obviously. Building condition survey, that's what the BCS is. Uh, this is the um, facilities long range plan. Projected 90 million or more uh, is needed to do our, our, some of our capital work. So that's still out there. We were, pardon? Did you repeat that number? Uh, 90 million or more will be needed. Just wanted to clarify. <laughs> we were uh, fortunate last year. We established our, our capital reserve and we were able to contribute a little over $3 million, which is fantastic. I uh, would recommend we continue to fund the reserve. Uh, the reserve will be our down payment, if you will. And uh, the, the larger our down payment, uh, the, the lower our interest costs will be when we, when we have to borrow or issue bonds, serial bonds. 
And then finally, I have a, uh, a bullet here for our TRS, Teacher <coughs> Retirement System, Employer Contribution Rate. So this rate increased from, you see, 9.8%. I think we were kind of estimating a 10 last year to 10.63%. ERS is, is flat, but, but TRS is the more significant uh, number for us, and that equates to about 450000 for our district. So, again, I hate to be the prophet of doom, the doom and gloom guy in the budget. Dawn said that to me well, to last that. year. <laughs> but, but if we just look at the numbers, so foundation aid is up about 737000 but but we're a million three, a million five on the health insurance, you know, half a million on the TRS contribution, uh, 105,000 on the transportation out of district. So, you know, this needs to go up. I, I think it will, um, but it's still, um, still not a great picture, you know, for, for next year's budget. Okay, and I won't spend much time with this. This is the, the my budget triangle. The budget, it's, it's much like a triangle. One side, we have our revenue. We have our appropriations or our budget. And, and you know, based on our revenue, what we spend our money on, we have our instructional program. And the, the takeaway here is, the in the long run, our expenses, our budget, uh, cannot exceed our revenue, right? And uh, the, the other thing I would point out is in this era of the tax cap, our revenue is constrained, right, by the by the the, I'm air quoting the 2% tax cap, which is rarely ever really 2%. So we're limited here on our revenue. We're limited by the uh, increases in state aid. That, limit, that limits our appropriations, our expenses, and, and therefore our instructional program is limited. So we really try to maximize and stretch uh, our dollars. Okay, I won't go into this. We'll kind of skip over this. Sources of revenue, local non-property tax, state aid. I've mentioned this. It's, it's supposed to be equalizing. So uh, wealthy districts are getting less. Uh, districts in need get more, et cetera. Um, let's see. There, the, the types of aid, there's general aid, which is the principal one is foundation aid. There's categorical aids, such as high tax, textbook, et cetera. Then we have our expense-driven aids, which are the, um, the aids such as building aid, transportation aid, and BOCES aid, where we spend money in one year, we have eligible expenditures, and in this, the, the following year, uh, an aid ratio is applied, and that is our aid in that category. We also have some federal aid, the IDEA, which is 611, uh, 619, that's Individuals with Disability Education Act. And we have title grants. Uh, interesting fact about IDEA, it's, a federal, it's federal money. It was intended to cover 40% of the cost for special education students, to educate special education students. It's around, as of uh, 2008, I think this number is a little different, uh, like as of 14, it's around 17%. So again, it's, it, it's a federal mandate. It was intended to fund 40% of the mandate. It's actually funding more like 17. And finally, we have real property taxes. The ta right, it's a, the tax of last resort, right? So um, when all else fails, the property tax uh, is picking up uh, the remainder. Okay, and, and this slide is intended just to sh sort of show the, at the state level, the school aid process. So it, it begins with the New York State Education Department's uh, Regents proposal, and so that, that was released on December 11th of this year. So again, the, uh, the Board of Regents is recommending a phase in of foundation aid. They recommended a, a $1.6 billion increase in funding for schools, which is a 6.3% increase, which is, is good, it's needed. Uh, that was allocated between foundation aid 1.25 and the expense-based aids and a couple of specific uh, areas expanded UPK, career and technical <coughs> education, so those were priorities that they had last year as well. The executive budget proposal, in other words, the governor's proposal for school aid, was 600 and, uh, I'm sorry, 768 million, or a 3% increase. And again, it's allocated between the various aid programs. One interesting thing, the governor, this fiscal stabilization, which was 64 million, that is, just a placeholder that the governor, it's like a pot of money that the governor has put out there in the last two years with no details attached to it. Strange. Um, 
but I guess ultimately it's it's just 64 million that's going to be plowed into one of the aid areas. But in any case, um, the the one thing in the governor's proposal that's notable, that's that's um, potentially problematic, is this new aid cap for building transportation and BOCES aid. So these are our expense-based aids, and the governor is proposing um, these be capped at 2% annually. And they operate slightly differently. The building aid cap would be statewide and proportionally uh, reduced, and the others would be 2% by district. Now, the good news is I don't think this will come to pass, but the, the idea of the cap on the building aid is, let's say we need, we go to the voters and, and we ask for the authority to borrow money to issue bonds, right? And we do that and we say, we think it's gonna cost us this much money over the next 20 years. Because in the past, building aid was more or less a sure thing. What this would do is, is change that, that each year, there would be a pot of building aid money, which, which could not increase by more than 2%. So it's, um, it's troubling because you would have less predictability uh, in the future about your building projects and, and how they would affect your, you know, your, your taxpayers. Fortunately, uh, the legislature uh, opposes this, that's my understanding, and um, they've actually done a computation where they think this has the potential to shift about $115 million to local school districts. So that's an idea that's out there and it's something for us to keep our eye on and, and um, I think lobby to, uh, you know, in opposition to that. And then based on the region's proposal, the governor's proposal, there's a reconciliation where the governor and the legislature come together, uh, they arrive at some sort of compromise. Um, it's usually, you know, somewhere in the middle, you know, so I think this number will, you know, obviously, I don't want to say obviously likely to go up from the governor's proposal. Um, the state budget is due on March 31st, so, you know, over the next month or so, we'll, we'll probably have, you know, tighter and actual final state aid figures. Okay, and, and so this slide shows some actual state aid figures for Monroe Woodbury. So. These are the major aid categories, foundation aid, BOCES aid, et cetera. Uh, this 2018-19 uh, executive budget proposal uh, shows what the governor is proposing right now. As I said, we're, we're hoping the foundation aid would increase. And um, this is our 17-18 budget, revenue budget um, projections. And, and we see the difference here. We've discussed in the foundation aid. Um, we were seeing a little increase in BOCES aid. Some of these, you know, we have to be a little careful about um, because they're projections. And, and like, for instance, some of the expense-based aids are projections that we made for this year, you know, the beginning of this year or in the summer about how we would expend money for this year. And then our aid projection is based on that. So we generally look at the BOCES aid a little closely because it's a combination of what we say we're gonna spend, what BOCES thinks we're gonna spend. The high cost and private excess cost aids, these two numbers here, are for uh, special ed expenses. And, and these are a funky formula. Again, it's like a three-year average, so that can bounce around a little bit. You see the, the uh, variance here from what we budgeted for the current year to what uh, we're projected to get next year. So you have to watch that. The private excess cost is the same. This is um, high cost excess cost is for public pl placements. Private excess cost is for private placements for special ed students. Hardware technology, these are the instructional material aid. It's not much of a story there. Transportation is pretty level. The one area that we're sort of looking into a little more closely is this reduction in building aid. Um, We've, we've discovered a couple of things, again, having to do with projections. Some of it has to do with, um, there, there were expenses associated with the water testing, which we, we thought would be fully aidable, and they're not. And there's a few other little things we're looking into. But, um, but the bottom line here is right now we're looking at only a $600,000, $616,000 increase. Uh, budget to budget in aid, and that's a little over one one percent. So, we're hopeful that number will go up, and um, we'll we're going to keep our eye on that. 
Okay, and this is just a slide. It shows state aid as a percentage of revenue, and, and we see here for the last full year, which was 1617, it was 30.5%. Uh, That's uh, an increase from 29.3. And, and so you can kind of see the trend. It seems like we're trending back up a little bit, which is good news. Um, interesting fact, we, we came across some paperwork from the late 60s uh, associated with the district. And the district was receiving around 50% of our revenue uh, from state aid. So times have, have changed. Okay, and this slide just shows actual revenue categories as a percentage of total revenue. So the categories are property taxes, uh, state aid, and I just lump everything else together. Those are all those um, local non-property. And so we've been pretty consistent around 30% for state aid, around you know high 60s for the property tax, and, and one and a half or so for the, um, for the everything else category. And I'm going to skip some of these. Um, there's a collective cheer goes up in the room, right? Um, <laughs> uh, but we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to do more on the property tax cap on March 7th. Uh, okay. So Elsie is getting the hook out, so I, I will just keep going. <laughs> okay, so this is the tax cap. It's so you see, just here's a little history of the, um, the levy growth factor. That's the one factor. That's the 2%. So it's 2%. 2%, 146, 162. So this was the year two years ago that I mentioned, the dismal year. It was trending up a little bit, so we're back at 2%. So that's good news. Okay, and, and so I'll just spend a minute here. Uh, we will populate this with, uh, with data at our next meeting. This is actually the simplified worksheet that I've shown the board in the past. And this was the tax-based growth factor that I was mentioning. So for the current year, it was 1.0308, about 3.1%. For next year, we're looking at a 1.7% a, you know, a, a increase. So that's good. That's good news for us. And then down here, this is the levy growth factor. So this is where it was 1.26. And next year, it'll be 2%. So we're going to fill this in. What we're actually looking at and examining a little more closely is this area, the, the capital levy exclusion in school districts unlike other local governments that are also subject to the tax cap, we have an exclusion for capital expenditures. So the capital expenditures for us are essentially our debt service, net of any state aid. So it gets a little uh, complicated. Our other capital expenditure is our, our bus purchases. So we're examining that because changing this uh, affects your next year tax cap. So, so we want to be careful uh, and we want to be, uh, we want to do this the right way. Okay, and here are just some important budget dates. So our next meeting is March 7th. Uh, we're going to review uh, Dr. Hassler and I, books two and three, but potentially uh, special ed as well, I think. Um, on March 21st, we're going to review personnel budget. On April 4th, superintendent's budget recommendation. The board is slated to adopt the budget on April 19th, which I think is pretty close to the last day we can adopt legally. We will transmit the property tax report card on April 23rd. We have our uh, public budget hearing on May 2nd, which is a statutory requirement. Uh, we mail our budget notice uh, somewhere between the 3rd and the 9th. And then this year, May 15th, is the actual budget vote date, the annual meeting, um, where the community comes in and, and votes on the budget and our proposition for buses as well. Uh, so that's all I had. <laughs> Uh, this is a little budget humor. It says, if they've been throwing money away at the schools, they certainly have been missing this place. And I don't know who put this in here. Who, who did this? Who put that in Somebody there? put <laughs> did you Elsie's put that in name on that. No, I, I don't know how this got in. This, the, the, the deck of slides. My hair's not that short. <laughs> Leah, that's not you. <laughs> uh, but... Are there any questions? Okay, so I just have, um, you mentioned that there has been an increase uh, due to um, the students needing transportation that are going to other schools. Um, talking about non-public schools, not special ed, just Non-publics, that's correct. Non so those parents are taxpayers. So True. 
so you, you mentioned that there's a, it's kind of like a, a loss. However, if you've got 11 students, and we know there's more than 11 students going to outside schools, and 11 students' parents are paying $10,000 in taxes, you've got 110000 right there, and you're showing $105,000 as a negative, like we're under. So, I mean, I would think that that's a help when they're not used in our facilities or being part of the school, because what does it cost per student in the school? I, I think that's one way to look at it. If they were actually in the school, it would it be more expensive. More. That, that I think that's true. That's one. That's one way to look at it. Um, we were just looking at it from the sense that we. I think a lot of folks were here, but not requesting the services they're entitled to. And I think that may be the change that we're seeing. That 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 for whatever they don't know reason. If they can get Busing within the, the sentiment has changed where we're entitled to transportation, we're entitled to textbooks, we're entitled to uh, related services, you know, we're entitled to a whole slew of services and items and that we're seeing a, great, a higher utilization of that. I think that's and potentially think the, the point difference. is if, if they had done it five years ago, we would already have that Plan. calculated into our budget and then when you look at the 2% increase or whatever it is, it would be reasonable to suddenly see a shift. I think in the last three years, it's gone from 30 grand to 800 grand, mm -hmm. right? So to see a sudden shift, um, the because we have tax caps, it, it doesn't anticipate that. So that's that's where so the the money ends up coming from someplace. Does that increase inclusive of KJ buses, or this is just outside like? You know, I think school? it's easiest that when we get to the, the slide, mm -hmm. like I basically could you know give you the the history, Don't you know, and it this. would be Good. a lot uh, easier to understand the entire well, path of. But but it is inclusive. Are. But yes, it definitely. Answer your question. Mark. We've got our both mm -hmm. special ed transportation, and then we've got uh, the contract transportation. Are you mad at me, Elsa? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should leave it up there for the rest of the presentation. No, okay, let's move on. I think you should put, we need to put that on Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> no, I can't because it's copyrighted. I just show it oh, at so. these you meetings. See, so take it down. As long as he is, <laughs> take it down. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, including myself. Any other questions? Okay, more to follow at our next meeting. So next up is Dawn Russell, who's going to cover the transportation budget. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to present the uh, transportation uh, general fund budget and uh, school bus proposition for 2018-19. Oh, um, our $4,631,000 transportation budget is comprised of 30 individual uh, budget codes. Um, I'm going to highlight the largest of those for you this evening, and then when I'm done, it, please feel free to ask um, if you have a specific question on any other line item that we didn't talk about tonight. So this chart, chart sorry, shows the uh, general 5510, which is our general operation, and it consists of equipment, rental, uh, rental maintenance, uniforms, outside services, fleet insurance, safety supplies, and gas and diesel. I don't think that this works. No, it's okay, and it is okay. 4.9% of the budget is a garage building, and that would be utilities, outside services, garage building insurance. <coughs> And then the 48.7% is contract transportation and special education transportation. And then 23.1% of the budget is our uh, bus proposition. Okay. Our fleet travels approximately 1.6 million miles uh, annually. We're asking the board to approve the replacement of 10 vehicles this year. Uh, most of those vehicles that we're asking uh, for replacement are collectively have in excess of 1.5 million miles on them. 
and were purchased in 2005. Uh, we are asking for eight large buses. Uh, one of those would be equipped with an undercarriage storage uh, for equipment for trips and athletics. The other two uh, would be for two Suburbans, not quite as fancy and tripped out as the one you see there. That's the one that they had online. Uh, we, we get a much, much more uh, subtle base model from the OGS. So, but it would look like that, and it would look like the other two that we have. Um, it's important that we replace. We we have two. Those uh, will be uh, put to use as plow vehicles. They're half-ton vehicles, the two that we have that have over 130,000 miles on them. We could use them for a mail courier vehicle. We could use them for security. We could use them to plow. They're very versatile, and they can probably use till they're 200,000 miles on them. So um, that's the good news. Um, we use those vehicles often um, for students that are temporarily on crutches or unable to walk the stairs of a regular bus. If Sometimes they need a car, sometimes they need something that's more um, high step up, and that's why we need Suburbans. Uh, the increase of $81,040 is uh, an 8.2% increase over uh, last year. So in our equipment budget this year, we've added GPS. I can't think of a better way to measure our return on investment than by using fact-based data that could be provided to us by GPS. Uh, GPS, it's already an industry standard for trucking companies, U UPS, FedEx, uh, the post office, etc. It's um, an emerging trend in public schools. Uh, it would give our mechanics immediate and live notification if a vehicle is experiencing engine problems. It's amazing. It could be right through a phone app, through a computer, uh, through an email. It would fully integrate with the routing software that we currently have, we own. So we, you know, there'd be no additional purchase there. Um, then what we could do with that is we could uh, take up a planned route, a route that we have planned, and we can see by looking at the GPS if the bus is following the route that we planned for it. And um, you know that will be that's very helpful when you know, you're doing your reports and your comparisons. It will, uh, GPS can enhance driver and student safety by always knowing where your vehicles are. When you have students on buses, you should always be able to find them. Monitoring driver behaviors and using data as a training tool, uh, it might indirectly lead to savings, lowering our insurance premiums just by monitoring driving behaviors. And we'd also be able to track environmental regulations such as excessive idling, which is, you know, a waste of fuel. Okay, go to the next one. So GPS would work hand in hand with an electronic rollout sheet. I am amazed every single day when I walk past the dispatch desk and I see that book. That book right there is, that is our daily dispatch. The paper isn't big enough anymore. We're taping things to the bottom. And it's just, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not good use of technology. And we're in an operation the size of ours. Technology is invaluable. Eventually, it, we could phase in within this same school year, we could phase in the parent notification app. So basically, the driver comes in, they're in a spare bus. That gets logged in. Uh, or if they're not in a spare bus, but it's a spare driver, and the attendant is different. It gets noted as they're cl clocking in in the morning. The parent will have an app, and the, pa the app will tell the parent who the driver is going to be, what the bus number is going to be, and they could see where the bus is, at what, not, you know, what time, like how many more minutes till it gets to their stop. There's just so many things we can do with this. It's literally like a countdown clock till it the bus drives It is <laughs> amazing. Like an Uber? Yeah. yeah. It is amazing. And actually, you know, I spent time with Bargoff. He's come to my office, and, um, you know, I'm showing him all these prototypes, and I want to try this, and but we have to try that. And he said, you know, why? Why do you have to try all of that? You have this amazing program, a routing program that's tried and true, um, and it has all these extra things that it does, and we're not even utilizing them. So we don't need to try all the mom and pop 
uh, softwares. We need to use what we know and what we have and work with that. And that's kind of guided me along the way to to you know to this point where I know that we could get a program that will just integrate with what we have already. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so gas and diesel, you'll see that uh, we've budgeted an additional $10,000 uh, uh, budget to budget increase on uh, gasoline and diesel. Uh, the prediction is one cent decrease in gasoline, eight cent increase in, in uh, diesel for the coming year. We continue to participate in the Clarkstown School District uh, cooperative diesel bid. Last year, we only saved about a total of $14,000. It wasn't impressive. It's nice. It was a savings. When we get a delivery, we go on OGS, which is the New York State contract. We see what it would have cost if we bought it that day, what we actually paid for it, and then we just see what our savings is. And last year, I have to say, I mean, it, it, was, it was a little disappointing, but we stuck with it. We said, you know, uh, we'll try one more year. And to date, we've saved over $32,000, and we're only at the halfway point. So, you know, we're doing really good, and I'm glad that we are participating. Um, they basically do all the work. We have our legal look it over, and we have not had, I've been here six years now, we've not had one problem with that, um, being part of that. So, um, Fuel prices can be very unpredictable. It's difficult to budget from year to year. Uh, we've been fortunate over the last years that we've predicted well and the budget, uh, and we've budgeted properly for our needs. Uh, this year, the average cost of gasoline is about a dollar eighty-five that we're paying. Um, last year, it was the dollar sixty-four, and the average cost of diesel um, is a dollar ninety, and it was only a dollar thirty last year. So we always have to have that cushion, and we have to be you know, careful of what the predictions are. Here's the story about, um, about our contract transportation. So it's best to explain it this way. In 2011-12, I know it says 20, doesn't it? Oh, 2012, okay, because it didn't spill over. Um, all, you see the gold bars. We only had the contract transportation code. The BOCES coaster didn't exist back then. So those uh, that uh, those gold bars in the beginning, the first three years, represent routes that were contracted outside of the county, all special ed runs that were outside the county. Then the BOCES coaster uh, came into play, and then you'll th those are the green bars. So now we didn't. We no longer had to go out to bid those first first three gold bars, those were probably 10, 11, 12 different contractors doing this work. So now that we're uh, participating, participating in the BOCES COSAR, which happened around 2014-15, that allowed us to share transportation with the 19, 18 or 19 component districts in um, Orange Ulster BOCES. So as you can see, the, the COSAR um, increased, the number of students going outside the county increased. Then, of course, you have your CPI, and then you know, you get to the point where you're in the 2018-19 school year and your budget for uh, the BOCES COSAR is $1,450,000. Now, while that might seem like a lot of money, I can guarantee you that if we kept going in the other trend, we did not have the BOCES COSAR to share other with other districts, we would be paying at least 30 to 40% more than that $1,450,000. It, it's a fact, and you could tell by who you're sharing with. Just you know, do the math. Um, but that's what I do. And then, um, so now, if you go back after the first three years, and you look at the you know the very small bars, which were you know from 14, 15, and 16, we still did contract some work out. It were they were municipal agreements with uh, KJ and also with Washingtonville, with Southern Westchester <laughs> BOCES. We had a very small contract where they would take our kids from Clearview to uh, to their CTEC programs, things like that. So we did have maybe 30. Five to fifty thousand. The numbers you see here are budget to budget numbers changes. So we might have spent a little less or a little more than that. Then we get up to this 2017-18 uh, school year, where the growth of the KJ area schools. So during that period where it was very low, we were transporting approximately sixty-four 
uh, students in the K uh, KJ area schools. We did those with our own vehicles. And, um, and then when the transportation requests started coming in, we could see that we were being inundated with transportation requests and we began to think that might have been a, the right time to go out to contract with this work because we got to the point where we had 433 students from 64 to 433 and those are students who have enrolled and registered in our district because if you don't register, you're not entitled to transportation as far as Monroe Woodbury is concerned. So. Um, on top of those 433 applications, we have about 100 to 110 other applica applications that came, but they're not registered yet. So we can't provide their transportation, but we know that they're anticipated. They're there. They just haven't come in and registered. So you have to be prepared for that. The other um, piece that you need to know is with those, with those um, the high numbers to jump in, numbers of students to jump in the cost for their transportation. We're talking, we're not talking about going to the KJUFSC. We're talking about 16 schools in a two square mile area. There are 16, and there are more now, but we're still only transporting to the 16 because that's what's in our contract. They have bell schedules that are set about 15 to 20 minutes apart making it very, very, very difficult to get from one part of town to another. So when we started this contract, we had route packages. We call them uh, route packages because it's whatever you can do with a bus in six hours. So they packaged it. So they would package, the contractor would package up as much work as they could possibly do. And those 10 route packages now, since, have turned into 15 route packages and hence the you know increase in cost we do share we we wrote the contract and we included Washingtonville and Chester UFSD as um, you know able to share with us and they do and they pay their own portion of their students um, but uh, you know it's it, it, it's impossible for us to do better because the way that the bell schedules are, it doesn't allow you to combine certain schools together, and it doesn't allow you to get uh, the their, um, we the families are are building on the outskirts, and we're going to Chester, and we're going to we're going to Woodbury, when Chester, Catherine Court, Damien Court, I mean, off of Craigville Road, it becomes, and then we're sharing with the Washingtonville School District, which, you know, you're going out to Blooming Grove. So now we need to be able to get into this big circle and pull uh, whatever the corridor in Chester that we can, you know, pick up as well, and get back in 20 minutes because it's easy for them to do because they are in a two square mile area and they, that's very, you know, that's doable for them. So that's our challenge. Okay. Will the uh, upcoming changes from the annexation have any effects on these numbers? From a transportation standpoint, there were only uh, about six families that lived in um, that area. Well, it won't it won't add more time. The building will add more people, mm -hmm. but it won't. Um, luckily, it's right there, so. The timing is okay. Um, they, as long as you know, I think we went from using some vans to using big buses for everything. And I say we, I mean our contractor. And you know, they follow uh, the same uh, our rules. You know, we set the standards. I follow their buses around. I see where they're picking up. I see who's getting on the buses. So does my assistant. We keep a very watchful eye on your tax dollar, our tax dollar. You know, it's it's just and it's it's very um, time consuming. And it could easily slip if you're if you don't watch. You have to watch, and you have to be able to anticipate. So, with the 110 students that are not registered yet, you don't really know where you would be transporting them. They can end up having special needs and be absolutely. Completely. Yeah, within 59 miles out of here, they could be, and you know they, that that's a it's a possibility. Uh, we, they, um, certain schools tend to send lists of students, and there is a loophole. There, I don't say loophole, but a there's a law that says that you can send a list as long as that they have a. Um, 
certified letter on file at their school from the parent that gives them authorization to send us lists. But those lists are pretty, um, they're almost better for us because they're very easy to read and understand and we can import them as an Excel spreadsheet. So we almost appreciate that, you know, it's okay. Um, but it, and then it also, so we mark down who has a uh, student ID number and then the rest of the kids that don't are the kids that are not registered. So, and now of course we still have a month before uh, the deadline, which is April 1st for non-public school transportation. So we'll have to see what's happening between now and then. This seems like it'll be a constant uh, negotiated point mm -hmm. for additional annexation. Absolutely. Because this will be yep. the justification yep. for additional acres to reduce our bus cost. Mm -hmm. So we can expect that to jump when there's a need or a perceived need for more annexation of property. I hope I was able to explain that well enough. I didn't want to get too detailed, but okay. Okay, so the combined uh, bus purchase and general fund budget has increased by $329,827, or 7.668%, uh, for a total of $4,631,101. And then if you have any questions. Did, did, we, did we address any of the, um, I know there was some discussion about cameras um, in the buses. Are we yes. doing anything additional with that? Well, yes, actually. I'm very happy to announce this. We uh, we had nine buses that were un, that were not equipped, and those were just the ones that are the oldest ones in the fleet. Right. So after careful consideration, and you know, we decided that we would find the money and get those cameras uh, buses equipped. The packages were just delivered yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a process, uh, and uh, the installer came today to start organizing. And um, the good news with those cameras, even though they're in our older pieces of equipment is that when those pieces of equipment go to public surplus, all of those items will be removed and mm -hmm. every one of them will be able to be utilized because they're brand new. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be, because what I ordered for them is the newest technology. So very shortly so, we'll have cameras in every bus. Yes, probably in the next two weeks. Okay. There'll oh, be one, in, I mean, it could, they're a piece of equipment, Good. something could go wrong, but yes. And um, our, Just as a side note, the, the Suburbans and cars do not not have and never have had cameras. We haven't had the need for them, so I think we're just going to leave it at that for now. What is the uh, what is our bus fleet? How many? We have 170 vehicles. So you had nine without cameras. We had nine, but they're always the spare buses, and you know, because. I'm, I'm, and then, I'm, then the I'm newer buses go on trips. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. I mean, it's been a long time. I think uh, the cameras were introduced about 12 years ago, so it's taken all this time. You I, know, I think but. we just realized we want to have cameras on every bus. We don't right. want to have any gaps anymore. Right. And it was became difficult for dispatch because we knew some routes maybe were a little more difficult. This one must be in a camera, and this one is, uh, you know, and then we're switching buses last minute, and it is just, just much, it's, it's a better, better idea. This um, GPS um, that you were talking about, mm -hmm. will it be able to download, or well, when you get whatever the system is to integrate what we currently have, mm -hmm. will it be able to download each driver's route, what they did, so that you... It'll yes. Automatically come out Should be real time, right? Yes. In it's real uh, time? yeah. It's real yeah. time, and then it, it, it saves a report. It's a cloud right. base, mm -hmm. so we don't need all this storage. Or else, we'd need something the size of a bus garage itself. Um, yeah. So it and it's it, it will create a driver report card, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And um, you know, um, I'll give you a couple just really simple examples. We'll have a parent maybe call the bus garage and say. You know, I think my child's getting to school late every day. She can't seem to get to first period. I think the bus is late every day. So we say, well, I don't think so, but you know, you have to check. So we have the driver radio in every morning when they get to the front door of the high school. So we have the charts, we have charts all over, and they chart the every morning, and then on Friday comes along, I call the parent back and I say, okay, well, the bus arrived at, you know, 6.53 and then 6.58, and so, you know, and I go through the whole week with them, and then the, she's, you know, they'll say, oh, oh, okay. So maybe we need to move the locker. 
you know, it's simple. We just move on. But if I had that data, those are the most simple yeah. things that I could just <laughs> click on and say, well, according to our records, you know, it looks like that the bus arrived at this, this is a typical bus arrival, but on this one day, it may have been late because I, you know, so, and now with the construction, I think it'll even be more important. I think she touched upon the good one. Like in case of emergency, this yes. become a really important right. for parents. I mean, mm -hmm. I have two young kids mm -hmm. and I want to know if the bus is 10 minutes late. Right. So is, that, will that that's a feature great, be on the app? That's a great side yeah, event. Mm -hmm. Will yeah. you be able to put that like for the Let's app? Let's not go too much into the app. We will be testing it and then okay. we will come back to that <laughs> process. Right. To so tested. again, this is a process <laughs> that we will be testing it before right. we get to the point. Yeah. yeah. I think right. that's a we great will be feature. Happy to take some because otherwise you're relying on like, you know, you got the kit. time at the store. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. No, you'll get online at Target and you'll get all tied up. You'll be able to, if a bus, for some reason, the same bus every day is sitting in front of someone's house because they're yes. always late coming out. Will you be able to well, monitor that's been idle for so long? Will you be able to right. then where the bus went the by my house say, like a freight train? And you, but you could know actually, yeah, you could see when the bus is stopped, how long, how long, because it gives you the telematics, how long the red lights were on, how long the yellow lights were on, how long. Well, the, so, you, you know, know, obviously, bus driver know you know this is the right. same mother that's always late every morning. But right. You don't want to penalize the kid, let's say. Right. But he's that house is making the bus really late. So then you can go back to a household and call and say, listen, the bus driver's waiting two minutes. If the, I don't care if the kid's running down yeah. the path. If he's past two minutes, we're leaving. Yeah, we do that, but much nicer. I know. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's basically it. Don't get me stopping it. Are we doing Is that <laughs> no, part of it? Now you no, have concrete it, evidence it, no, to it's prove stop. that the bus is sitting at your house. Right. It's just for, sometimes people think that because they're at work already. A lot of parents, especially with high school students, the parents are at work and they really are only going by what their child is telling them, that the bus didn't come. So... I, I don't even know sometimes then until the driver gets well, back, but now I'd be able to bus. tell them. Once we yeah. implement this, we'll come back with the update. Yeah. Right. We're That's very great. excited yeah. about great. it, though. And very the, excited. the next stop, next. and if they have time to get to the next stop. And chase the bus? Chase the bus. Now, the bus stops even if there's nobody at a stop? Well, to stay on time, that's the best thing okay, to do. So Unless, of course, you know that child's never, never, ever there. The parent said, you know, we don't need the bus. But it keeps you on track. Uh, yeah. Let's test, let us test the app before we mm -hmm. come back. And we'll come back with the process. There are no, he just asked a general so question. We don't want yeah. to go too far in what yeah. I can do as a parent or not. Yeah. Yeah. Our first goal is to equip all the buses with the GPS. All these are the side effects. So we'll test this right. process and we'll come back with the we'll understand right. the capabilities and then yeah. discuss that right? yeah. 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 any other questions it's next no. All right. no. next it's, okay <laughs> Okay, so next up is uh, Peter Corderoni, who's going to discuss the uh, buildings and grounds budget. Barbara, we need a second screen for next next year's budget. He approved it already. Hi and good evening. Before I start, I'd like to thank everybody in this room for making me feel invited and included and in everything from day one here. Um, it's been a great experience so far. Um, this is the Buildings and Grounds budget for 2018-19. Over the last four months, I've walked around the buildings, a lot with Andre, a lot with other principals. We talked, I listened, and this is what I came up with goals and as far as the budget. So budget goals for 1819, continue to maintain a high level of cleanliness and maintenance, maintain the capital investment in the district facilities such as boilers, asphalt, fields, replacement of maintenance equipment that are no longer serviceable or reliable. Everything gets old, you gotta replace it and upgrade it. Continue conserve energy to minimize the district cost to operate. Operations and maintenance overview. Uh, this is something I've always brought to my budget presentations. Uh, Everybody knows we have a lot of square footage, but no one knows what the breakout is. So the custodial staff cleans roughly a million square feet nightly. That's like having 333 3,000 square foot houses or six 3,000 square foot houses per staff member cleaned every night. Same with the grounds. 229 acres maintained by each ground staff relates to 29 acres per person. This is in addition to preparing for the playing fields for school and community sports. With over 1,260,000 square feet, 
Our maintenance staff keeps a high level of professional, secure, and safe environment to help students, teachers, and staff to reach their potential. Renovations project completed before I got here and through the year I've been here, 17, 18. Safety and security. We've um, established security film for windows and doors. Uh, maintenance projects, we did district-wide blacktop seal coat and striping. High school carpet replacement and damage repair in two floors. Middle school water booster pump and filter. District-wide stage lighting, it just did some. Sound systems working on and curtains have been re replaced. North main door and hardware replacement. Middle school replacement of casework in home and economics areas. And created a new uh, computer lab at CV to allow students to take New York State exams online. Renovation projects for 2018-19 is coming summer. Pine Tree in Central Valley transformer upgrade, as Patrick talked about earlier. We're on actually working on it now. High school B and C house office carpet replacement. Middle school gym dividing door replaced with curtains. That's a curtain that comes down. It's a soft curtain. We're having problems with the dividing door now with the snow load on the roofs. It actually binds the door. We'll no longer have that problem. Middle school loading dock door replacement. It's just due to age. Uh, same with grounds garage, three overhead door replacements. North Main lower field sprinkler system. I'm working with the village to see if I can get water across the street to the field. And that way we can have water on the field and make the fields better. We water it, we grow grass, everything's happy and better. And that same train of thought, we're also going to put at North Main a solar power street light. It's a company called Aris. They do solar power. It's wind powered together. It has four battery backups in it. And you can run electricity. So if you want a PA system down there or anything like that, you can plug into the bottom. Also for security for light. Um, I jumped around a little bit. But bus garage, spray foam to insulate the garage. District-wide gym wall pads, replacement as needed. And then this is the operations and maintenance budget summary for 2018-19. Uh, these are numbers that have gone up, and some of the reasons why they'll go up I'll explain. Equipment grounds has gone up $40,000 this year, but we are buying a deep tine aerator and snow removal equipment for the Venturec machine we just purchased last summer. Controls and monitoring systems up 51000 That is basically uh, manpower to better enable us to use our HVA systems better. We have two control companies, one Siemens, one Honeywell, and they kind of bounce between each other. So they, if by bringing an extra person per month, we be better controlled. Uh, brick and roof is up 38,000. Our roofs are getting old. Uh, repairs are needed until we do a capital project. So with this past year, I think we did over $50,000 in repairs just on roof leaks. Uh, the next comment is asbestos hazards and environmental uh, other miscellaneous expenses are up 20000 That is due to SED state required testing and inspections. There's playground inspections. There's um, chemical inspections. There's chemical removals from the labs that were taken out. Uh, so that's all tied into that. And then O&M supply and grounds is up to 18000 That's material like grass seed, fertilizers, blankets to f improve our field conditions. Ongoing look ahead, continue to work on the five-year capital project, continue to improve the conservation of energy, greener floor finishes throughout the district, it's healthier safety, chemical-free auto scrubbers and green cleaning procedures, the same reason, continue to be fiscally responsible for custodial supplies and overtime control. And that's it. Any questions? Not a question, just a comment. Go ahead. I was at a Boy Scout meeting last night at North Main, and the floors look gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. It looks beautiful. I second that. I know you put some of the bigger projects that were taking place, but I know I've mentioned in the past that it's the little things that people notice, the pine tree sign, you know, little things like that. It definitely <coughs> makes a big difference, and hopefully more parents are noticing that, you know, the little things. Me, the staff is very good. I have a yeah. very good staff. I've actually walked into a great staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next and we up. hope in the future you you said we, you know we'll see or whatever you said about <laughs> we we greeted you and embraced your 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 being here and we hope that that continues <laughs> we trust it will. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, Superintendent Rodriguez, Cabinet members, colleagues, and the Monroe Woodbury community. After careful review and consideration, I have briefed the prepared a brief overview and summary to support my recommendations regarding the safety and security 
department's 2018-29 budget requests. But first, I'd like to thank everybody in this room for the tremendous amount of support that I've been given and, that, and the attention to school safety that we've gone through over the last week. Uh, for the benefit of the community, as I do the presentation, which I did briefly earlier, for the students that were here and had to leave, I think it's important that I'll go through it again because there was some details that I, I missed that I will add, but I will be, I will be brief. <laughs> School safety staff. We, use, we utilize a combination of full and part-time offices to cover the schools and campuses. We have approximately 15 full-timers and we use part-time subs. Many of our officers are retired law enforcement professionals who bring many years of experience to our district. Our school safety officers cover schools and many non-school related events throughout the year, inclusive of their roles like school resource officers. At the various buildings, they work with the building emergency response teams, the BERT teams, during drills and real emergencies. The officers conduct traffic control and make tours of inspection to identify any potential safety issue. School safety staff can be, continue to be a valuable asset to our school safety program. Security and emergency preparedness budget. Over the last several years, a substantial amount of money and resources have been invested in the Monroe Woodbury School District's school safety program. I continue to work closely with our technology department and the assistant superintendent for compliance and information system, Mr. Bargav Vias, to take the best investment approach with obtaining the latest security solutions for our district. Working in the scope of our strategic plan, with the support of our smart school bond, our infrastructure upgrade goals will continue to support our plan priorities. In December, we participated in a technical threat vulnerability assessment of our district by a private security vendor. They'll be providing us with a complete debriefing this upcoming Monday on February 26th to our cabinet with the findings and recommendations, which will include integration technology suggestions, panic alarm options, and grant funding opportunities, just to name a few. We are excited and anxious to receive this critical input. Our upcoming initiatives include, but are not limited to the following. Visitor management, Raptor. At all of our schools, Raptor is a web-based visitor management system designed for K-12 schools. It is currently trusted to protect over 18,000 schools across the nation. It has the ability to check the sex offender database and is responsible for alerting officials of attempts to enter schools. It is credited with the arrests of numerous absconded sex offenders that have crossed state lines. Additionally, it has been credited with over 250,000 custody alerts since its inception in 2002. We will be piloting two units, one at the high school, one at the middle school, in mid-March. If all goes well, we'll have five more rolled out in July. This is a welcome initiative to augment our existing access control protocols and enhance our security. Also, we'll be pilot we are piloting an anonymous alerts anti-bullying safety reporting app for smartphones. After careful review and consideration with other smartphone reporting technology options available, we have selected anonymous alerts. This technology is utilized in thousands of schools throughout the United States. This empowers students to help themselves and others by anonymously reporting bullying and safety issues quickly and security to school officials. After a brief rollout and awareness initiative at our high school and middle school, students, parents, and staff can download the Anonymous Alerts app for free and gain access with a simple activation code to place reports directly to school officials. Web-based reporting is also available to students, parents, and the community. Message topics for submission may include, but are not limited to the following, bullying, cyberbullying, family issues, self-injury, drugs, alcohol, depression, sexual harassment, and unusual behavior, just to name a few. This will be another proactive initiative to enhance safety for all. We've been looking and researching this since September. The same thing with our visitor management system. It's just coincidental that this tragedy happens, but this has been in the works. Care, 
care, community awareness, emergency response. And thank you again to our law enforcement that are here this evening. We have the chief of the Monroe Police Department, David Conklin, and the chief of the Woodbury Police Department, Kevin Watson. Kevin and David and the state police and our local law enforcement partner with us on a regular basis. Um, this is a group of not only our local, but our federal, state, county, first responders, and the elected officials. We meet at least twice a year. We talk about our goals, we talk about expectations, we talk about school safety as it affects the school and the community as a whole. They provide us with valuable input and support during all our drills and training exercises. We will continue to work closely with our law enforcement for mutual benefit and training opportunities. Additionally, from our partners at the New York State Department of Homeland Security Division, the state police along with Orange County Management and the Sheriff's Office, we've utilized our facilities over 15 times to do cross training. They used our buildings. They practiced at the high school, the Sapphire dorm. They've done initiatives, initiatives with active shooter, with canine response, and other emergency preparedness training opportunities. They're a welcome addition, and we support that constantly. Our care group is a benefit for all. We don't wait for an emergency to get together. Unique drills and emergency preparedness. From September to present, and New York State last year changed the law. The fire drills went from 12 to 8. Four of them have to be lockdown drills. So we've done, we do continue to do that. We've done over 21 drills from September to present, which included lockouts, lockdowns, shelter, evacuation, rapid bus recalls, and relocation drills. We do lockdown drills during inconvenient times, we utilize staff members, secretarial staff call the drills. Uh, the announcements are made by them to get the building in motion. Every time we initiate a drill, law enforcement's there, we debrief at the end, and we learn a lot. And I'd like to thank the principals and the district leadership because they do a terrific job. They're like incident commanders in the buildings. When we're sitting down at an admin council meeting and the principals and the assistant principals are not available or busy, their staff run the building is just, just, just like they're there, and that's what we need. Staff development and emergency preparedness initiatives. In January, we ran two classes on management of aggressive behavior. Verbal judo on a telephone. Basically, training officers got an opportunity. It was three hours of training. They got a certificate, uh, and it's an eye-opener, and it's something that each year is important. The following week, we did it with a lot of secretarial staff, custodians, and other staff members in the school who contribute so much and work so hard to the safety team and concept. We're happy to provide this training to them. It doesn't take a lot of time out of the day. Staff development is critical and key. I mentioned earlier that we can purchase all the technology that they have. Um, we can hire as many people, but the existing people make the true difference in the schools, including the students. District-wide video monitoring. First of all, our law enforcement monitor our cameras as well. We have over 100 cameras district-wide. We've increased our retention times. Every time we plan on putting a camera, we look to get a mutual benefit. For example, if we put a camera on an exterior building, the police are in part of that conversation to help us decide where it goes. Uh, we're gonna continue to work on that, and other details are mentioned on a confidential basis. Supplies and equipment, we currently utilize vehicles from the Transportation Division to support our safety patrols and campuses. With the construction picking up around the community, we have our vehicles out there challenging the contractors and the vendors, ensuring that they have the proper credentials and are not so close to the building, that they're not leaving tools behind. We understand the agreements and everything that they say they're gonna do, but we double check. We're gonna triple check. It's an exterior person that's an augmentation to what the police provide us. And again, the police provide us with walkthroughs, they're parked strategically on our grounds and campuses, and they're there in a moment's notice. Line item budget. Basically, you see a 9.48% increase, and that's gonna support the two initiatives I mentioned with the Raptor visitor management and some other uh, computer-based support mechanisms that we're gonna implement. Any questions or concerns? I actually don't. 
First, I want to thank you. Every year when you present, I'm always amazed at how informative you are, how detailed, and how passionate you are with keeping our school safe. And it amazes me that your budget is so little. Like, you know, I would be willing to give you anything, and it's, it's really a very small budget, and you give a lot. So, thank you. Um, hold, hold her to that. <laughs> <laughs> she meant personally. <laughs> um, you know, this, this has been very close. You know, this whole tragedy that occurred um, hit home because my first cousin was in that high school and my other cousin was in the middle school. So I can't begin to tell you what it was like for our family on Wednesday. And um, thank God they're okay, um, but I do pray for those other um, families. You mentioned about um, our employees that are safety, uh, security um, offices that are retired, military, retired law enforcement, blah, 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 blah. And we are living in a different time today, and I'm sure that although guns is the issue and you've got mental illness and you have whatever else, it is a major political agenda on the whole gun thing. So who knows if that's ever gonna end, but has it ever or is it gonna come a point where maybe these uh, retired offices, these retired military personnel who know how to use would be protecting our schools? Or is that something that should be talked about that perhaps they should be carrying in our schools. We already know that the teachers are here to protect. You heard it in Parkland. They jumped in front of bullets to protect those students. So that's not the question. But the people are gonna do what they need to do. But as far as having security that really can be ready for that and carry, not just, you know, they have to have licenses, and armed, you know, and have those, not just being a retired cop or retired military, but have a specific type of license to protect us. Is that something that is so, Elsa, you said there were two armed guards at that school, right? There were two armed guards at that school in Parkland. Well, they have a right to carry, anybody has a right to carry in the state Correct. of Florida mm -hmm. anyway. So you would imagine that everyone could have been carrying. So, you know, here we don't have that right to carry. That's, 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 a, that's a philosophical, approach and a belief. Um, I will be very honest, I have never supported having, um, other than a police officer in their position as a police officer to carry a gun in the building. Um, that would have to be a conversation that we have. I don't know if that resolves the problem. That's like an immediate response is let's have armed guards in our schools because that will protect our children. Um, I go back to the incident that happened. There were two armed guards in that school district. And that didn't stop this young man from doing what he wanted to do. And, and I said before at the beginning of this meeting that I feel that this is a real, this is a multi-layered mm -hmm. issue. And I think that rather than let's going right to, because I have received emails from parents who said, you know, when are you gonna put armed guards in the building? Oh, okay. um, I, I have received that. And I think that I would rather talk about potentially having an SRO officer um, than bringing a gentleman who was a retired police officer and now has a license to carry a weapon. No, I'm just saying because we already hired them. We already have retired police officers, correct? Correct. And retired military. He just mentioned so No, we do. Right. So that, but that just makes sense. I agree with the armed part of it, but is there a way for... Uh, maybe not having a, a taser. Can our security guards be equipped to carry tasers? I mean, I know you have to be close to the person. You can't be, you know, but then again, I don't know if a security guard is going to take a shot from across the room if he's not a, you know, maybe a police officer probably wouldn't even do that, but uh, a security guard maybe would not be able to shoot somebody down the hallway. But is there a way, uh, are our security guards allowed to carry other types of mm -hmm. takedown weaponry? A taser is, is, is not shooting anybody, wouldn't necessarily, you know, discharge and kill somebody by accident. I mean, I guess it could. Uh, I don't know if there's a rule that a police officer can only carry a taser. Can our security guards? I'm just trying to beef it no. up a little like, bit more without going to the next level of Yeah. Well, well my thoughts so are... Can I, can I just... Because this is, and I think this is a, 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 a deeper conversation yes. 
than having it here and, and there are legal implications of having someone who we hire to carry a gun in our, you know, in our schools. So why don't we do this? Why don't Frank and I and the cabinet and along with our police um, department talk about this? Because again, this is, this is philosophical. Our children are not accustomed to going to schools and seeing people with guns. The only people they see with guns are police officers. But they're also not accustomed to going to school and not going home. So that this is, is the world we're in today. But, but we need to talk about, is that the solution to the no. problem? Mm -mm. So we, it's, it's a multi-layered problem. And I don't think, in all fairness, that Frank should be the person who is asked that question. That question should come to me. I'm the superintendent. And that's something that he and I, and along with my cabinet and everyone else, should be a discussion. It should not be up to Frank to be asked that. And I know that no, he's, he's in charge of safety and security, and I respect you, but that is going to be a decision that's I made. respect you, too. I know you, too. <laughs> I think, right. I think right. our question is that what's going around is at the talk, because, you know, that would be something that is out there where police would probably reaction. want to be, yeah. you know, uh, part of this. I mean, Frank says they come in here already, so they're not going to always be here. So it's not, I wasn't asking Frank to make this decision. It was, is there something that's... Happening out there. <laughs> it's it's a discussion, and I, and I do discussed. think that we need to have a a, a stronger discussion about this. It's Ms. very complex. Run. Yeah. Sorry, you said you had a question. Can I ask a question? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It, it's I think it's not necessarily regarding that issue, but this is something for Mr. Squanti that students face. Um, there are many. I think this is like pretty specific to the high school, as it's the biggest building. Um, there are many, many entrances besides that main entrance, and students run into conflicts where they see somebody outside through one of the doors who maybe who is a who is a teaching assistant or someone that they do recognize, um, but they come into conflicts where should I let this person in? I do know them. Should I not? And then you have the conflicts where teachers and other security guards are getting involved. I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on how it would be easier to redirect traffic like of visitors coming in through the main entrance. Yes, no, that's a very good question. I'm going to speak in detail with Mr. Cassidy about that further. Uh, students get confused. They're in a whole stairwell. There's a familiar person outside the door, and they'll open up that door, and, and you know, we'll correct that action. But um, we need to tighten that up, and, and you, know, you have to come through a... Door. A specific entryway. It's the main door. It's the main door. Um, so it's a conversation. There's a lot of stuff going on now that's bringing that to light. It's a change of culture, and it's definitely a move in the direction we need to be going. But, but the rule of thumb is, if you shouldn't open the door, they should have either a key or an ID to get in a door. And if they don't, they shouldn't be going in the door. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. However, it's not rude to say that I can't open the door no. nowadays. No. However, Safety. you need to address that. Exactly. You know? yeah. We'll take care of it. Right. Thank okay. you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, Thanks a lot. Stand You're in welcome. the corner and talk. I'll be there. So, does that need to be You have no microphone. You need to be in a mic. Well, move, mic. move the mic over there. He can't help himself. Put the microphone on your desk. This is what you are comfortable to do. You can do it. That's fine. All right. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Board of Education members. Um, Mrs. Rodriguez. Uh, no, it's only six slides. Toto's uh, brief. He hasn't said anything. My colleagues and uh, directors and administrators. Um, technology budgets truly is a shared decision-making process. We start this process in November um, and ultimately work with department chairs, our library coordinator, Laura Lerner, um, our teachers, comes to the assistant principal and principal, and then we present it budget to basically Mr. Cahill. So this year we started the process in November. Um, and why technology? Like, what's the purpose of doing this? Technology, I believe, is a truly the single most powerful tool in today's world that can change the outcome of how our teachers are teaching and how our kids are learning. With the help of great teachers and a technology tool like what we are using it and what we'll be using, we are changing the outcome of these kids and we're preparing them ultimately for the job that doesn't exist today. Yesterday I learned that one of our recent graduates is working for um, a, an Australian uh, defense contractor and operating the drones. What a powerful satisfaction that for us as our stakeholders in this district. 
that, and he's a 2009 graduate, so he's not that far from the graduating years. It's like eight, nine years away. When he was in the high school, there were no drones existed. So this is the power of technology, and that's, that's pretty much why we integrate the technology with help of uh, Dr. Hessler and curriculum department to work with our teachers and ultimately shape our next generation. So basically aligning with the, the Board of Education vision of strategic plan, um, we actually started working in, in October as a part of the technology committee, and we basically developed the three recommendations. Um, the, the three recommendations come up with a new technology plan, and that happened to be now the new state requirement that, that came out last month. Um, the new technology plan is due uh, for the next three years in October, so we will be working with our technology committee for for next couple of months to develop a new technology plan, integrate the new in, the new standards and what's latest out there, provide provide the professional development to transform the classrooms uh, into the digital learning environments. Today's kids does, do not learn the way we learn in the high school or middle school, so we have to adapt to the newer changes, whether it's using the technology one way or different way. So ultimately, the PD becomes a very powerful tool to help our teachers to educate them. And with their great teaching skills, integrating this technology will help our students to become a better learner. Um, and, and third one is to improve the district technology infrastructure with the E-rate and smart school bonds. Bless you. Bless you. So we utilize, Bless you. Bless you. We utilize the different funding, um, not just rely on the general uh, general budget as well. We have an E-rate, which is about 50% E-rate for our school district. We, Because of the E-rate for last year, we improved the infrastructure, wireless infrastructure for our K-5 building. Next year, the plan to use the E-rate funding to improve the wireless into the high school and middle school. Smart school bond, we actually have been approved approved for the smart school bond. Unfortunately, the day our, con our approval came, the contract for state cabling expired. So now we're working with Mr. Cahill's office and also our, um, our uh, architect, land associate, to come up with the RFP so we can go out to the RFP and hire the right vendor to do the new infrastructure cabling in our school district. This will actually help us to become the truly high-speed backbone and that kids can use any devices that they want. It doesn't matter what kind of the device they carry. Um, I will be, there are four technology codes that, 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 take, that I'm respo we're responsible for that. And basically it's the data processing, computer literacy, central printing, and library media. Now if you notice, there are, there are two codes that went higher. It's 5.15, 5.15% and 6.8%. This basically the increase of what, what was happening for the last couple of years that we noticed, like the data processing, we, we utilized some software, like in the HR, we use my learning plan and we use the ASAP, the substitute management system. This was actually budgeted in HR. And every year we do the budget transfer from the HR budget line to the technology budget line. Hence, we spend more manpower costs. So this year, we're becoming more proactive. Ultimately, when Mr. Kravitz presents his budget, will be reduction in his line item. The same thing with the computer. Thanks, man. Um, so the same thing with the <laughs> sharing the wealth, and the same thing with the computer literacy. Um, the major increase is because of special ed. Special ed uses a lot of technology nowadays as well. And we used to like we did the budget transfer this year. I would say about 21 21 time, and the year is not even over. So instead of doing this manual data entry in our in our financial system, this is the better way to budget that. Um, central printing, it's actually a zero percent. Um, and it's really the, the, the thanks to the ID management system that we implemented the last couple of years. Every single person who wants to print, they had to use their ID badge to authenticate the, the copiers. I know many folks don't like it, but that is the main reason we kept the cost zero. At least it's not going up. Um, library media, we are actually um, going to purchase a couple of new database software, um, and the cost is a little bit up. It's only $3,000, it's 1.71%. So the next three slides are the pie chart of what do we do uh, in the different budget lines. So the data processing, the, the glaring part here to you is the BOSIS is 67%. Um, we work with BOSIS very closely, um, and we pay their admin charges, so why not we use them for the purchasing power? They provide us with the better services for the, they negotiate the price on behalf of all the 25 school districts and ultimately guarantee us, most of the time, the best price. Um, so, so usually the, our budget is heavy in the BOSIS line item. There are some miscellaneous software, there are supply line, but the main, main portion is the BOSIS line item. The same thing in the, the, the CAI process too. We use a lot of software that we purchase through BOSIS. Not only we get the aid back for the following year, but also we get the almost the guarantee to the best price. The central printing, um, 
This year, we, earlier this year, we implemented the online printing approval process, and ultimately a teacher can scan a document or attach the PDF. It goes to a, a software, uh, and then principal approve it. It comes to the technology department, uh, and automati automatically it goes to our print shop, and magically the print job appears on the teacher's desk. So instead of writing a piece of paper and then pushing the paper around four or five different stages, this is pretty much the much easier way and much efficient way. So this year, because of that implementation and the ID badge authentication system, we were able to keep the cost to a no increase. This is just a glance, um, this is just the, the basic snapshot of what kind of the devices we have in technology, uh, in, in, in the district. We have smart boards in virtually every single classroom, projectors, iPads, iBags, PCs. You notice the two line item for the Chromebooks and Chrome bases. So in the last two years, we rolled out almost 2,000 Chromebooks um, in the district. And it's basically thanks to our teachers and administrative support. Obviously, it's a technology department. They're awesome. Uh, but again, this is the new trend. Uh, <laughs> not, no, no, the, 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 team, the team that I work with, they are phenomenal. Um, they, they are really good people to work with. They take care of, take care of everything. But anyway, so, so ultimately, we rolled out about a couple of Thousand devices. We manage about 6,000 devices in the school district, not counting uh, the back end devices. Uh, this is the chart of the trouble ticket, and in technology, we now have a saying like no ticket, we can't really do your, your support. Like you and have to really open does a mean that. That includes me as well. So, and that's, that's, that started as a running joke, but now it's the way that how we efficient we are. Um, you, you notice that usually the July and August, these are our summer projects time, and, and as everybody comes back in September and it starts going up, and then by January, February, it kind of like plateaued around 200 tickets. But that's where we start preparing for the summer, for the summer big projects. <laughs> Some of the new initiatives that, that we are taking under for the next school year. Elsie wants to opt out of that ticket. Thing. Uh, I don't think that's an she's option. Just, she's murmuring complaints <laughs> here about this. And the ID badge. If you don't have an ID, if you don't have your badge with you, you can't get a you copy. Keep your badge with you. I know. <laughs> we can get you that Disney thing. thing. Yes. The, 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 like a little yeah. bracelet. Can I get a wand? Swipe it. Right. So the, the new, <laughs> the new initiatives. Um, we were rolling out more Chromebook cards uh, that would be in two, five building middle school and high school. Um, we this year we are we actually are piloting the equipment recycle plan. What happened in the in, in the last few years that we purchased the Mac or we purchased a device and then ten years later we have not replaced that. So this will allow us to come up with a game plan of if we purchase a device today before even we purchase what is the game plan to replace that Chromebook in five years because that has an expiration date of five years. So yes, it's great that we're rolling out two thousand Chromebooks, a thousand Chromebook every year. What is the plan in next five years when this device goes out of business or out of warranty or cannot be functional properly? The other part in me feels strongly that if we're teaching these kids, we should be teaching to the latest and greatest. We shouldn't be teaching that 10 years old software or 10 years old hardware because in the real, ex uh, real life, it doesn't exist in the Microsoft or Google world. Um, introduction to the Ozobot. This is actually a fun little device that allows the kids to program and virtually uh, ultimately uh, test their STEM skills. Um, this is mainly going to be in a K-5, actually two five buildings. Um, increase of the virtual reality toolkit. Thanks to our uh, middle school library, this year we started the initiative of having the social study uh, uh, kids, uh, teachers piloting the virtual reality, basically using the Google virtual rea reality package. Our goal is to extend that to all the middle school classes and possibly to the high school. Um, some of the internal infrastructure, we are actually upgrading our storage area networks, which is where our files are being stored, and also the implementation of the disaster recovery plan. Um, we rely so much on, in today's date, on the internet. If the, something goes wrong, if the fiber get cuts at the MCC, what is the game plan? If there is a testing happen to be, we're working on that plan so then it should not affect instruction for day-to-day -day operation. Um, implementation, single sign-on, that's actually a good solution. So if you ask today's students, they may have a five online uh, textbooks that they're accessing. They may have a 60 or 70 databases that they're using in high school or middle school. They have, if you ask the teacher, they have, may have access for my learning plan, ASAP, the computer logging, email logging, all that different password gets at the end of the day, it's like, oh my God, that's so crazy. This will allow us to actually create a portal 
And once you log in once, it authenticates you to all the different solutions. So the student will, with the one ID and a password, can log into this portal, which is called a Classlink, which is a third party app. And then you can see the different tab, different icons, like you can check your email, you can do the reflex math at home, you can use the IXL, or you can check the library <coughs> database. We are piloting this with over some of the teachers this year. The goal is to go live in when we come back in September. Some of the wireless infrastructure upgrade based on the E-rate and the implementation of cybersecurity initiative. This is actually a fun one. So um, la around Thanksgiving time, we actually send out, right actually next to the next day of Thanksgiving, we send out an internal email to the staff, um, and it looked like, almost looked like it came from Amazon. Now, what it does to us, it allows us to collect the initial data, how many people actually open it. There are about 10% of the people from the staff, it opened the, the email. The purpose of doing this is how we can educate our staff and student ultimately to be more tech savvy or more cybersecurity aware. This is the new day we live in and not every single email we get, you have to click on it. You can simply delete it. This, this, this process allows us not to shift the culture of the building in technology, but also make them aware. In today's world, the same thing applies to if you're doing a, a browsing at your home. It doesn't have to be always on the school computer. Um, so this will be a fun initiative to go next year. Um, ultimately, it will shift the culture in terms of cybersecurity. Um, the couple of Kaven solutions, we will be buying the ABC and a Go, Go Noodle Plus. Um, these are the, the, the good software that our kids actually use. We'll be using it next year. Uh, some of the library resources, um, it's, if you notice that in 10 years, our library increase, it's been almost <coughs> like 33%. Library in today's day becomes a hub for the resources. So it's 33% increase um, to the subscription of the database, and average daily visitors from the middle school and high school, it's like about 400 plus kids visit every single day to our library. Um, we are also looking into some active learning space technology um, that we are actually talking about that. This allows our students to learn a little bit differently in a comfortable environment. We also um, uh, we're also going to buy some more subscription for the Tumble Books and a Pebble Go and turn it in, which allows our students to be more authentic and not plagiarize the, the, their work, just <laughs> copy and paste from Google. Good. And I have a short video, and that will be the end. Uh, can we take a bathroom break?
special thanks to Carolyn Prudence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any what? questions? You could, could I ask a question? You would, I don't want to put the principals on notice or uh, on the spot, but I noticed in their budgets coming up, there's like $170,000 in textbooks between the high school and the middle school. Is there a way that you have Chromebooks? And I mean, why do we have to purchase? I mean, I like a textbook, but the kids don't want to look at a book. So the question is, is why are we purchasing textbooks if we can put them online? The, the textbooks that you are approving typically now are class sets of textbooks that they use. The textbooks remain in the building. If, if I'm a social studies teacher and I teach three classes of global mind, I only have one set of textbooks for all three classes, and students don't take those textbooks home. They're only for in-class use because we're not fully one-to-one -one yet. We still maintain textbooks for the kids to be able to use in the building. But almost every single textbook that you approve comes with an online access where the students don't take the books back and forth at home. They use the textbooks at home online. So why can't we just use them in the classroom? Why do we need the book in the classroom is my question. If we have whiteboards and Chromebooks and all this other stuff, I mean, why do they have to flip through the textbook? We're purchasing. Well, well, uh, that's all I'm asking. I don't. We, we I don't think have, it's we, because we don't have. Here's the thing: we don't have one to one. We're not fully one to one. When we become one, when we are one to one, then we can do that. But right now, what would happen is you would have a class that doesn't have enough Chromebooks for the Correct. students to, to read their books. So we need the physical copies. So one, one of the things that's on there for the high school is, is uh, Global Mind Social Studies textbooks. That cost is for a six year online license plus a class set for each of the teachers that teach Global Mind. Digital, digital books aren't cheaper. No, they're and, not. And, and, no. That's because, actually I was going to because say. Because the, no, the, the paper book lasts for five years, mm -hmm. but the digital book, they charge you so much every year, so right. it's. Right. I'm just asking. Right. That, I mean, right. 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 you know the kids at home are going to rather log on on their iPad and read. Right. And they do, okay. and they do do that. Yeah, but it, but the cost is still the same, which is, you would think it would okay. be cheaper, but it's not. I, it was right. I don't think the many many publishers are embracing that digital world yet, especially in the K-12 education. It's changing a little bit, but not quick enough. Um, uh, Anthony, did you have a question? I did. I had a quick question. You were talking about the equipment, uh, you know, having after five years, we, we replace it, we want to have a plan for all that. I'm just wondering now, what, what do we do with all the equipment that comes due? I know, like with buses, we have a, an opportunity to sell it or auction it. Are there similar things when it comes to computer equipment? So, not really. It's in fact cost us to actually remove the, the, the computers because it has, the, the, this, it is, that is a um, mercury in the monitors. So it used to be $45. What we do actually, we work with BOSIS. We purchase 90% of our, of our equipment through BOSIS. We worked out a process with them, so they will arrange the pickup at no cost to us. We are in the, we are at the stage that a lot of our equipments are about 10 years old, um, and actually that is a negative resale value. But eventually, we will be to the point that usually it starts with five years. By the time the real finance part works out, it becomes seven to ten years. So it's an ambitious goal to start with the five year. The reality may be seven to ten years. By that time, Chromebook, the, the purchase price is $170. After five years, it becomes paperweight. Okay. It's a history crop. It appreciates immediately. Um, um, anything else? I, I, you know. Thank you so much because you have really brought this district uh, up to speed. It's a team. And it's yes, but yeah, there's been a lot of changes. And what saddens me though is that there was a line in there that said that kids will be able to view the world without leaving their living room or leaving their classroom. And I feel like technology has also been a negative because kids are not socially um, out there. They're hiding behind, and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm, there's one way to you look. Really I think it's a balance. Do. I don't know about the balance, but there's a lot of more isolation, I think. It's it just, makes it easier for all of us, actually, not just the kids to hide behind the screen. Right behind something. Thank you. Uh -huh. thank you. All right. Comment. Thank you. Um, thank you all. We appreciate it. We're going to take a short five minute break yeah, and then do the. Uh, oh, guys, uh, I can't get any more word out. We are resuming after a short break. We've taken two short breaks tonight. No board business was done during those breaks. I have to say it's legal. 
Yeah. You're right. I'm I have glad to, you are okay. saying that. I have to say that. Um, all right. Uh, overview of building budgets. So I'd like to begin by returning to Mr. Cahill's budget triangle. And uh, uh, you got a kick out of that. Um, I'd like to start by saying a very big thank you to the building administrators, um, the building principals, their administrative teams, department chairs, um, Bargoff and his team. There are so many people that contribute to the development of the various building budgets, and thank you very much to everybody for their hard work in putting all this together. This represents about a million and a half dollars overall in the in the district budget. Also, a thank you to um, Mr. Cahill and his team. Jean Marie Broderick was fantastic in helping putting the, the presentations together. Tanya Mulrad, the treasurer, was very helpful, so thank you very much to everybody. One, one very quick, very, very quick sort of general housekeeping item that the presentations that you are going to hear tonight are on February 21st, 2018. We still go back between now and the superintendent's budget's recommend, budget recommendation to look at things like state aid and textbook aid that Patrick spoke about. We get approximately $400,000 a year in textbook aid. We make sure that we maximize that. If there are textbooks that we can potentially purchase this year, I'm going very fast, that we can purchase this year and I can take some of those out of the various building budgets, the budgets you're hearing tonight are the ceiling. They will only go down from here between now and when Mrs. Rodriguez makes her recommendation. And the just a reminder also, the HR portion is going to be on March 21st. HR staffing is not included in these budgets. Without further ado, we will start with Smith Clove. Chris Berger apologizes for not being here. He's with his family this evening. However, I will be presenting the overview of the Smith Clove budget. I've lost this thing again. I have issues. Very quick profile of Smith Clove. They have currently 532 students, 12 K classes, 12 first grade classes, seven various special education programs. The building is just over 70,000 square feet with 43 instructional spaces. They have a total of 100 staff, 42 teachers, three shared teachers, a part time teacher, 10 full time TAs, and seven part time teaching assistants. General assumptions in the development of the Smith Clove budget are a slight decrease of um, students. They are projecting 520 students. As I said, currently they have 532, the cohort of first grade leaving, and the anticipated cohort of kindergarten coming in. They're slated to have a, a, a slight reduction, so that brought their budget down a little bit. One notable item in terms of an increase, uh, there's going to be a $475 increase in their staff development line, which I will show you when I show you the the, the various budget lines. Really? This is the overall Smith Clove budget. The adopted budget for 2017 2018 is 122,586. The proposed budget currently for 1819 is $125,754, an overall increase of just over $3,000, just over 2.5%. One notable increase, you have the Smith Clove Equipment Rental and Maintenance Line, which is the Conacher Minolta copier contract, where there's a, a, an increase in that. And I, you have the Smith Clove Conferences and Meetings Line, which shows an increase right here of $475. Um, $1,000 for staff development is is challenging at times to extend, to send staff to conferences and that sort of thing, so we're increasing that money to um, that, that line to $1,500 for 1819. Well, I, I, Chris Berger, Chris Berger put that down, and he wanted me to make sure that I addressed that. And he said to me, if they have any questions about where I plan on using that four hundred seventy-five dollars, he gave me a list of different conferences to speak to that as well. Sorry. Right. Questions? Yes. He, he, I mean, they stretch, they stretch that money, all of them, very, very far. No questions. Next. Very good. Sapphire is up, and Karen Brock will speak to the Sapphire budget. Thank you all very much for having us here this evening. And special thanks goes out to both Patrick 
um, and Eric for their help and support, as well as the staff in my building, because it was definitely a team effort putting together our budget. Just an overview of our building, um, our current enrollment, we're at 315 students so at this moment, with seven kindergarten classes, eight first grade classes, and two special ed classrooms. Our building is approximately 44,500 square feet with 31 instructional class, in, classrooms, instructional spaces. We have 64 staff members in our building, 29 of them as teachers, seven shared staff, shared teachers with one shared teaching assistant, as well as, as, well as two full-time teaching assistants and six part-time teaching assistants. Projections for next year, I know Mr. Berger and I speak frequently with Mr. Cahill and Dr. Hassler. Their projections, we're looking at a very flat, slight increase of students, <coughs> excuse me, for next year. Um, so we're looking at a projection of 330 students between K and 1. Other than that, we are stable. Our requests... In addition to also looking at an increase of our professional development, we're also looking at literature within our classrooms to support the Lucy Calkins reading program. Budget-wise, based on our numbers, last year our adopted bless you, our adopted budget was eighty thousand seven hundred ninety-nine. Our proposed budget is eighty thousand eight hundred forty-five, with an increase of forty-six dollars. Outrageous! Over. Yes, it is. It, I, and this is a team effort. This, this that's right. almost a dollar a week. I mean, really? You know, it, you know I. We're, we're, we're going for it. I, I don't know what to tell you. We're going for it. Oh, the sapphire is winning. No. I love these guys so much. No, I love I did you guys not. so much. I tried. You can't even imagine. Let's, we'll remember this you whole conversation. Thank you. 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 Questions? No. None. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Any questions about $46? <laughs> no. Buy lunch. Thank don't you. spend it all in one place. Thank you. Okay. Up, don't spend up it all in one place. Up next is Brian Judice to speak about the pantry budget. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to sharing this information with everybody. Uh, our enrollment uh, has increased from last year's budget presentation to now uh, up roughly 60 children. So uh, the good news from the first two presentations, mine has gone up a little bit, and you'll see you'll see that as we go through this. My square footage is, is uh, the same, 113,000. Uh, there's 68 instructional spaces. We have eight sections of every grade level except for grade four. Now we have nine sections of grade four. Um, our, our instructional spaces also includes our our garden which is our outdoor learning center it's used throughout the, the, the September October months and even into November and then of course into the spring so we're proud of that um, we have 139 professional staff 12 of which are shared with that throughout the district uh, new initiatives we have a continuation of our of our writers workshop and also we have five teachers next year doing a full pilot for the readers workshop, which we're excited about. And those teachers are set up with the classroom uh, library that's, that's necessary to go along with the philosophy of readers workshop. So we're excited with those, with those five teachers moving forward next year. We also had um, a, a new cello and a tuba that was purchased. And the, the sharing of those instruments will allow uh, the parents who are having difficulty getting those large instruments back and forth to school, they can keep their rented instrument at home, and these instruments can be used uh, for the kids during during uh, rehearsals during school. So those are being uh, purchased to be maintained and kept at Pine Tree uh, to assist with, with the, the transportation and large instruments not being allowed on buses. Um, our enrollment, like, as I said before, has increased roughly 60 children from last year's budget to, to now. And um, uh, we would like to also take in mind that the, the consumable materials in preparation for transient students, so the, the children that are moving in mid-year, are not being uh, denied. They're still they're still given uh, materials that they need for the rest of the school year, and also, of course, the the, the instruments that I mentioned before are, are quite expensive. Um, requests for the the increase in the consumable prices that we have. 
Uh, also, the continuation of our field trips. Uh, grade two went to the Challenger already. Grade three has a field trip planned for the Hudson Highland Museums. Grade four is going to the New Windsor Cotonment and Knox headquarters. And grade five will be going to the FDR Museum up in Hyde Park. All cur curriculum based, all great field trips for our children. And um, so we're looking forward for that, for that to continue. And then I mentioned again the new cello and tuba for shared use throughout Pine Tree. So our increase is 6.45%. Uh, and that is attributed to our 60 additional kids that have entered from last year's budget number to, to today. And um, you'll notice there that the, 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 the music instruments that are being considered are $4,675. And also the phys ed equipment that you see there is with regard to getting a new sound system in our gymnasium. Uh, they, use, they use music to motivate children, to keep the energy lively, and to get the kids moving. Um, so that, 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 that money is going toward helping the audio system in our gymnasium. Is he just still making all that noise? To make it louder? So yeah, make it louder, exactly. <laughs> It's a wonderful sight to see the kids running and doing their warm-ups and doing all their stuff uh, with regard to, you know, popular music being played at the same time. So it's, it's, it makes PE even more fun than it is already. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is Rebecca Rodriguez, who will be speaking about the Central Valley budget. All right. We'll be right along. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here this evening. I just want to give a quick thank you to the Board of Education, to Mrs. Rodriguez, and to the Cabinet for the overwhelming amount of support that I've received in being the newbie, part of the team. It's wonderful to be part of a team that's so highly committed to public service, so thank you for a seat at the table. So quickly, about Central Valley, um, the most beautiful children, I have to say, in the district. Next slide, please. Wow. Okay. Whoa. Sorry, guys. Sorry. So we have our enrollment has... <laughs> And slightly gone down from last year. We, have, we are at 567 children. Um, our building is 108,000 square feet. We have a very interesting geography. Basically, the, the scope of our building, for those of you who have visited us, which is probably everybody, um, each one of our grades is housed in a particular wing. So it keeps Mr. Barone and I on the move because it is quite a vast building. Um, we have 48 instructional slash teaching spaces. We have 92 professional staff. That does include everyone from our custodial staff to our lunch monitor to our secretarial, to both myself and Mike. We have seven which are shared within the district. We are very proud to say um, that uh, our writer's workshop has been fully implemented um, in grades two to five. All of our students, um, by the end of this academic year, will have traveled through four to five genres, units of study. Um, and it has been a delightful sight to see our children celebrating their writing um, and exercising their voice as authors. Our children, uh, our, excuse me, our, our classroom teachers are also, um, you know, basically uh, giving themselves um, uh, a, a running scope of the Reader's Workshop this year, and we'll be implementing that full scope next year. Um, part of uh, what we'll talk a little bit about in terms of the cost of our text will be you know, the full implementation of classroom libraries. So in order to be able to have a robust and rich uh, Reader's Workshop uh, in every single classroom, they need to have a robust library. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. I want to celebrate and thank um, Mr. Um, Mr. Vias and and um, and Peter for um, helping us get our new Chrome based library. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, they were very gracious in capitalizing on some additional real estate that was right next door to the to the actual space. And so as a result, now we have a beautiful 21st century um, Chrome based library. So thank you for for that collaboration. We also will be shuffling things around a little bit um, in terms of just where our classrooms lie because we will be um, welcoming an 811 special needs class that's coming to us from Smith Clove. Okay, so assumptions for next year. Um, just uh, a quick overview. We have had 53 new students move in um, since the beginning of the school year. We have had 33 students um, move out, so it's it's kind of a squash um, that does impact the, the consumable materials that we do have to purchase, as Brian mentioned. Um, some of the requests that we have for this coming year um, will be, again, to continue to um, 
you know, grow our classroom libraries, um, to purchase Chrome-based library chairs for that beautiful lab that we have now, and that's going to be a little expensive. Um, we do have a request for um, a, an art kiln that is, replace, is a replacement because the old one basically was is just outdated, and an art table that does need to be replaced. So in looking at our budget, um, you'll notice those particular um, items that I mentioned. So for example, the um, line for supplies in art um, significantly went up exactly for that reason, because of the art table that needs to be purchased, as well as the kiln, um, as well as the, um, the math text. There's a little bit of a slight increase there because the price of the consumables went up. And I believe there was one other, um, the furniture and equipment, right, for the, um, for the library chairs that need to be purchased for our new Chrome Base Lab. So overall, I mean, even though we have had some significant purchases, we're only going up about 5.30%. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we will go down next year. You know, it won't be as... Hi. The, the kiln is helpful. Yeah, exactly. Any oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you guys can fight about the forty six dollars. You get out. Who gets the forty six dollars? Normally I can use this mic. <laughs> And up next is Joe Coder to speak about North Maine. I'm more concerned that Noreen is focusing on my bald spot, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, thank you very much for allowing. It happens. No one's looking uh, now. I know. I know. Now they all are. She is. Yeah, they're all. Thank sweet. you very much for allowing me here tonight. Um, North Maine is a unique place. Most of you have seen it at this point as the open classroom design. Um, we have about 530 students, grades Thank two you. through five. It was built in 1908. No, John, I did not start there in 1908. Um, I, know that's, I know that's coming. John, John Michael, Grant. I know, we know that. Um, we have 94 professional staff members. Taxi! <laughs> I'm going quick, John, I'm going quick. Uh, we do, you're gonna hear a lot of the same from all three of us, we have worked, I, I must say, it's been, this is only my second year as a building principal there, Rebecca's first. We have worked very closely as a team through all of this, through writer's workshop, through the reader's workshop as well. Um, so you can hear a lot of the same stuff from all three of us. Our programs are, our writer's workshop is fully implemented through all grades at North Main. The reader's program, I'm a little bit more fortunate that more, a few teachers actually have stepped up and really wanted to take hold of it, so I have about, nine sections of Reader's Workshop this year being piloted, so they're really gun ho with it. Um, it's just taken over at this point. It is just like Rebecca said. It is amazing to see the kids. The writing is just incredible. Um, the teachers are working through it. Um, it is a really a really cool program to see. Uh, we had a few things happen over the summer last year, thanks to Peter and Andre. Uh, we moved our health office from across the building close to the main office. They reconfigured and basically rebuilt um, a beautiful, like we call it our clinic now um, in North Maine. It's really cool. It's a beautiful job. Um, our library I keep talking about nonstop. Um, I know Elsie said she wants to try and arrange a visit. I would love to have everybody there. Um, it is a unique space. Rob Elser is our new librarian. Um, we just hired him this year, and he has done an amazing job with the artwork that you might have seen in some of the pictures of students from the high school coming over and painting on the walls to the work that he's done in there to moving things around. We also have a new Chrome-based lab as well in there, thanks to Bargov. Uh, so it's really, it's an amazing place now. Kids love to go there. Teachers love to bring their kids there. Um, it's taken a whole new life. And it is the center. It literally is physically. And it's the center of our second and third grade part. And it's the center of the building now, so which it should be. That's what the media center should be. Um, next one. Um, assumptions, just like I said, are supporting our classroom libraries for the reader's workshop. Um, we have, I have as just as well as Brian, we have what um, they call them shelves in the uh, Lucy Corkins program. We have bought several shelves for our teachers so that we can start to bring our libraries out of the book room, so to speak, into the classrooms, because each classroom needs their own library at this point. Um, so we've tried to support them financially um, by bringing those into there. Um, that went up a little bit in the section um, and continue staff development as far as supporting writer's workshop. Well, Eric, most of that comes out of his money, thank God. Um, but we try and put a few dollars of our own there. Going to the budget line item here. Um, Karen, what were you? <laughs> oh. um, I could go through its line by line details, but you really just want to look at the bottom line, which is my budget went down 2.9%. Just saying. Just saying. Um, it's amazing. Matt left North Maine and I saved money. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and that's it. If there's any questions. No. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Good job.
All right. Yay. Good job. Good job. And Mike and John are going to come on over. Yeah, yeah, so I think 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 I not respond. It never fails to disappoint. This, this is right. We're doing great. We're doing phenomenal. Oh, that's just uh, that, we're that's that's the thing. We're 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 they already know. That's right. Uh, up next is Mike Pisano, who will be speaking about the middle school budget. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, and the interest in what's going on in the middle school. We have uh, a few things that I want to highlight. Um, basically. Compared to last year, our enrollment will probably stay uh, pretty steady as far as our grade configurations are concerned, with a possible slight decrease according to New York State report card data. However, if we look at this this time last year, which we did, um, we we can see that they're actually the report card data is only so reliable. There are, there's a lot of movement within the district to the district from uh, outlying areas, which caused basically our enrollment to stay steady, and that's what we're looking for in the in the years to come. Um, we're looking to also expand some special programs that we already have started here in the middle school with co-teaching. We're looking to expand co-teaching into, currently it's only in sixth grade, it's going to expand into seventh grade as part of our special education continuum. Uh, next year it'll be a seventh grade program, the year following that it'll be an eighth grade program, so it'll be a continuous uh, continuum throughout the middle school experience. As I said, our enrollment is projected to slightly decrease. Um, originally, we're looking at a total of enrollment this year of 1,631 students. Our, um, our actual enrollment for this year, that's what was projected. Our actual enrollment is much closer to 1,700 students. Even if we see a slight increase or decrease either way, what we can say with confidence is that our needs will not decrease. In fact, the students that we're seeing enroll in Monroe Woodbury Middle School are um, coming with more frequency with special needs in some way, whether it's a student with a disability or a student from an economically challenged uh, home or a student who is learning English. Um, as a result, one of the things that we're looking to do to support that, curricularly speaking, is the Heritage Speaker course, which is going to be new to the middle school next year. Uh, that course basically takes uh, Spanish-speaking students who come to our district and are um, learning, you know, learning how to speak English. However, they, they may not have the literacy skills in their heritage language, in their native language. Um, and that's something that is really an asset. That's something that's a strength that they're bringing to our community. So we want to enforce that and build upon that by uh, providing some instruction in that area. So the Heritage Speaker course uh, is, is a new program, and that is going to be uh, also connected to some of the costs that we're seeing with the textbooks. New initiatives, um, you'll see that we've moved uh, some of our monies around to uh, support further staff development. Our focus on student-centered instructional strategies does not mean that we're going to be sending people out to conferences all over the place to get more professional development. What that's really looking at is providing our teachers with the resources and the time to, to help each other out and, and work as a team to develop sound instructional strategies that are going to support the vast array of learning um, challenges that we meet every day. So continued uh, growth in technology as well as highlighted uh, by Mr. Vias already, we have um, an increasing amount of Chromebooks, virtual reality, enhanced reality, and active learning spaces already occurring at the middle school. We're looking to further implement that. Some of our assumptions for the upcoming school year, as, as we stated already, decreasing slightly, um, not necessarily our needs. Consumables are still required, as we stated by the other building principles, and uh, no change to per pupil multipliers. Our requests, what we're looking to do is increase the amount of staff development that we have um, in, a, in a bunch of different areas, but especially when looking at student-centered instructional techniques. Our big budget items, as you've already seen, I'm sure, in looking at the budget lines, we have uh, two big 
textbook purchases. One is in uh, science, and that's actually in two parts as well. The big chunk of that is a sixth grade textbook. One of the things that we've been lacking is a one cohesive sixth grade science curriculum and textbook that coincides with that curriculum. That's something that we're looking to implement for this upcoming school year. It does, of course, come with an online component, but the hard copies at this point are still necessary. We're also looking to purchase a section of biology textbooks to be in alignment with the high school biology program. Currently, we're using two different textbooks. We're looking to build consistency across, uh, across the district. If you're taking biology in high school, as a high school credit, we should be doing the same thing in the middle school. Um, and again, I, I wanted to emphasize the, the consistency of experience in the sixth grade classroom as well. Having a textbook helps keep everybody um, literally and figuratively on the same page, uh, it, teaching the same content, presenting the same curriculum over the course of the school year. Our robotics <coughs> program has uh, been met with a tremendous amount of success this year. We have a very high enrollment in our club, our after school activity club. Um, it brings a whole variety of, of different students who may not belong or feel like they belong in uh, you know, sports or other already available clubs that really have, have taken a, a tremendous interest in robotics. And you saw a quick video of some of the things that are happening in our technology clubs. Um, but, uh, excuse me, our technology classrooms, but the club is really taking that uh, robotics technology to the next level, to the point where we have, um, for the first time, had a robotics team, which is competing and doing well, and we want to further support that initiative um, by budgeting some money so that they can attend those competitions. And in the technology line, there's some money there for uh, 3D, new 3D printers and curriculum coinciding with those printers. The idea is that with all of the technology, and, and Mr. Rios and I have this discussion quite a bit, it's not about getting new shiny things and putting them in classrooms uh, and, and kind of showing them off. It's about building student understanding and, and helping them to use these tools in new ways to try to predict what's coming in the future because there's no way of really doing that. But having them have the coding background and the ability to uh, manipulate what's going on with design and what the machines can do is really the skill set that's going to be necessary for the future. So the, the numbers in black and white, you'll notice that there is a uh, decrease there in MS principal equipment rental and maintenance. That's where we've reallocated some funds to uh, take that $3,500 and reinvest it into our professional staff development. That was the um, equipment fees that were necessary to do the eighth grade moving up ceremony in the middle school. Since we're moving that to the high school, um, and Mr. Cassie is generously hosting us for that event, um, it's not just climate control we're happy about. We're also happy about not having to rent those chairs and the stage and everything. So that's, that's something that will be a cost savings there. The big budget line item of the increase is the science textbooks, obviously, at $72,000. Um, and if you go to the next slide, there's another big... 20, where is it, $25,000 plus uh, for loot, and that is the textbooks for the Heritage Speaker course, um, as well as some seventh grade Spanish textbooks that are needed just because our, what we have is antiquated and, and falling apart. So we're looking to align curriculum there with a new textbook as well. So my, my uh, budget line, the bottom line, if, after seeing all the elementary principals present, it makes me feel awful. But, uh, <laughs> but you'll notice that the vast majority of that over $100,000 is, is going to be textbook costs, which are, um, you know, are a difficult cost, but it's, it's something that directly goes to students. And, and just a reminder, and it's, aidable. It, it, it's aidable. Last year, when Mr. Kravitz presented for the high school budget, we opened this heritage class in the high school, the cost of the textbooks then were just over $20,000. But when Mr. Cassidy presents now, the adopted budget ended up being about $2,000 because we were still under the textbook aid for last year. We were able to buy the heritage high school textbooks with last year's budget. It's very possible that we will be able to do the same thing with some of this textbook money and coming in under this year's aid. So again, these budgets represent the ceiling of what our requests are. By the time we get to the superintendent's budget recommendation, we anticipate that a lot of these costs are going to go down. So that way she will be able to come and say, I took care of you. Great job. Right. Great job. She'll take the credit. Yep. <laughs>
And finally, John Cassidy will speak about the high school budget. Five minutes. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present the budget this evening, and thank you for all your support that you have given us throughout the year. Uh, a couple of things that are going on in the high school next year. The enrollment <laughs> and grade configurations will remain pretty consistent. We have 575 seniors graduating, hopefully, and 576 eighth graders coming in, so that's pretty constant on that. Uh, we will be adding a linguistics class next year. We feel that this is going to uh, give our students an upper edge as they move out through their career and education and be able to help them maybe secure some other positions, some other jobs that they might not have been able to with just going through without a li linguistics course. Uh, we are con continuing to follow Mrs. Rodriguez's um, goal for us to offer college credit courses. Uh, we do have uh, the MW Cares Day that we have spoken about, and there will be another presentation on that at a future Board of Ed meeting, and we are looking at continued opportunities for articulation within departments. Assumptions are pretty much uh, consistent with last year's. Consumables are required for students exit in mid-year. We have e &L classes. Uh, those will probably increase uh, based on the numbers that we've seen this year. Uh, no change in our pupil parameters. Uh, we're looking at moving some money around for staff development conferences as we want to continue to support our staff. And pretty much, as you see on the next couple of slides, the bulk of our increase is also textbooks. Everything else, all our budgets are pretty much staying uh, pretty even, but textbooks are really the ones that are going to put us up to that higher percentage than the middle school. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one question. We got a big presentation about business, the business program, and I wondered if any of that was was included in, you know, the, those requests were included. So business uh, has brought us a lot of different ideas, including internships, and we are looking into uh, bringing them next year. Uh, we're still looking into how we can make that work. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez has made connections with some of the local businesses that have offered to take some of our students in for internships, and part of our increase for textbooks is uh, in the business department okay. to help them support all their initiatives as well. Okay, thanks. So the uh, textbooks that we're going to be increasing this year are in world language, business, math, science, and social studies. And under high school other miscellaneous student activities is money allocated for the MW Cares Day as well. And that would bring our total budget up to of an increase of, oh wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I went down. I thought I was higher than, sorry, Mike, 34.78. Sorry, Mike. Thanks, John. <laughs> really appreciate it. But a total increase of two hundred nineteen thousand dollars, which is a lot more than those. <laughs> We're also going to do some fundraising for the Monroe. Uh, yep, and that'll be part of the presentation at a, a future date. Yeah, the the money that the district is that we are requesting from the district is not going to cover the cost of the day. The the MW cares amount is right here in the other miscellaneous student expenses. Mm -hmm. That line is being brought up to fifty thousand dollars. So this increase right here, overall increase in the student activities budget, that's the money that's being earmarked for MW cares. That's the district contribution beyond just the fundraising. And as has been brought up before, during our fundraising efforts, by the time the final budget is presented, that number might decrease as well. Mm -hmm. um, the Global Nine book, it's uh, Global's two years, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's only for the ninth grade year? Uh, yes. Does that mean that next year we'll be seeing a new Global, Global 10. 10 book? Uh, it's possible, yeah. yes. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yep. And it, we have... I, that's what the, my question. They don't. They don't make a book that does both, do they? No. And, and that they, they, you know, I was thinking about something that you said with regards to the costs of the textbooks and the online fees. It's almost like you would think that the cost of a CD of of an album would go down because you can download it digitally, and there's absolutely no cost cost of actual production of that, and yet. The cost of an album nowadays is the same as pretty much what it used to be, and there's absolutely no cost of downloading it out of the cloud onto your device, but that they still... So most of us don't buy albums, we just buy songs. <laughs> yeah. But I don't Spot speak it for... Spotify, yeah. I don't think people buy music anymore either. Yeah. Just yeah. scream it. Uh, I just have a question uh, to you all uh, for presenting. On the staff development, um, each one of you have line items. My question is about, you mentioned about the mental health aspect, and what are we doing, and where are the teachers in that 
Is that part of the staff development? Is that going to be another line item? No, nope, that's right. What teachers will go, all teachers, will be inclusive of that? What is that? And, 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 look like. and the various departments, in addition to just the building, you know, John's, John's um, staff development budget is basically allocated for his building, and that's inclusive of every single staff person. The, the departments also have their own individual special ed, you know, special ed has theirs, mm -hmm. AIS has theirs, ENL has theirs, they, they also have it so that way, you know, Camarales can do a, a K-12 training for all the ENL teachers. Um, Eric, Christine, and Karen can do a training for all the school psychologists in the school district. But then John may say, you know, I have my instructional support team within the high school, but I'm going to use my high school professional development line to do a training for just the high school IST team, which could include, you know, a mental health component to it. So one of the things that we're doing, which is the beauty, I think, about having a strategic plan is that we're going to take a look at what the needs of the district are. We know that social emotional learning is very important. I mean, from just the surveys that we've, we've looked at. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've been doing is we're going to be, at the beginning of the year, we're going to say these are the four areas or the three areas that we're going to focus on, and this is the training that our teachers will receive. Definitely one area is going to be social emotional. As a matter of fact, Christine Ricker and Karen Jordan, and I believe even Eric Ulau, um, but more so at this, at the secondary level, is we are taking, they're going to be taking a group of teachers with them to several workshops. They're going to include social workers, um, psychologists, and one of the things that we're looking to do is when we attend these conferences is to be, to be able to turnkey it when we come back. And that's one of the things that we're committed to doing. But that's really going to come from the strategic plan. It will tell us what are the areas that we need to focus on. And those will be the areas that they call them strategic intents. That's going to be our focus. But definitely social emotional is going to be an area that we need to focus on, just from the data that we've received. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, do we have a uh, motion to appoint the art purchase committee for this motion. year that will be me, me, Lorraine, and Anthony? Second. Second. Will be me. Lorraine and Anthony. Right. Lorraine and Anthony. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. So carried. Uh, approval. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the 2018 19 student calendar? Motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? There being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Personnel? I respectfully request the requested approval for the items under personnel. Motion. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Business and financial. Patrick? Uh, I would also respectfully request the approval of the items under business financial. There's one item I just want to mention. I mentioned earlier the uh, contract for our uh, transformer replacement project, $990,000. Uh, we did a bid last week. We had an opening last week. And, um, you know, we're pretty confident. Um, Ray Pantel's a, a good electrical contractor, and um, you know this has all been vetted by our attorneys, etc. So we trust you. Yes. <laughs> um, do I have a motion, motion. to accept Second. business and financial? Second. Moved and seconded. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, uh, accept the uh, reports, recommendations of the committee on special education? Motion. Second. Preschool special education as in the agenda. Moved and seconded. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. Uh, reports by board and central uh, administration. Uh, uh, I just want to thank all the presenters. You guys, I know it takes a lot of work and effort to do all this. So, so I know, Dawn, you have to go out, and transportation is a big issue here in the, in the district, so it takes a lot of work. Frank, as well, security for our students is uh, paramount, and I appreciate all the, the, the school uh, teachers, principals, everyone that contributes into helping make uh, our school safe for our kids when they go to school every day. Other than that, good night. Everybody wants to go home. Thank you, Chris. Don. I already covered everything earlier. Suzanne. Um, I want to thank everyone who presented. I know it takes a great deal of effort on your part to come up with this budget, and I really appreciate your work. Um, I'm mesmerized, especially by this owl. The artwork is beautiful, but I can't stop staring at this owl. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
you could have my question. Um, I know we're all devastated by what happened in Parkland, and I, I just want to make a comment because I know the young people of this generation really want their verse, voices to be heard, and I really, even though they've left, I, I'm hoping they'll see this, and I really want to remind them that the greatest way to voice, to make their voices heard, is to get out and vote. Many of them will be 18 by November 6th, and they should get out and register and make sure they get their vote out there. And have a good night. Thank you. Leah? I wish everyone a good evening. Fargo. I'm good, thank you. Thanks again to administrators for their hard work and budget. Congratulations to our Section 9 winter champions. We're having a great winter season. Uh, congratulations to all of the drama productions, CV that had theirs, which was awesome, North Main that's coming up. Congratulations to musicians on their fantastic winter concert season. Go to uh, Crystal Run, this the, mall, the Galleria Crystal Run this weekend on Saturday because we have 11 high school students with their artwork on display. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for the work in developing the budget, and uh, that's it. Matt. I just want to say congratulations to the 14 people who were approved, their retirements were approved tonight. Mm -hmm. um, good luck to all of them in the future. Yeah, ditto. Uh, thank you all for the uh, presentations, and I just wanted to echo uh, the uh, Sen Jana had said that they were going to have a walkout, and I'm just hoping that they will coordinate that kind of stuff with the uh, with the authorities and the police. Thank you. Have a good night. I think they plan to. Yes, Stacy. Um, I want to thank all the presenters and have a good night. Anthony, I want to thank all the presenters. I got to see the Pine Tree uh, Science Fair last week, the Prism concert, and I did reading at Central Valley. Always a pleasure, and have a great night. And thank you, and good night. I want to thank all the presenters, and I did attend the musical The Lion King at Central Valley. It was beautiful, so thank you. Yeah, me too. Ditto. Do I have a motion? To motion. motion. Thank you, everybody. Motion. Good night. Motion. All, right. all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Aye.